availability of it, whether it's available to you. And those two combined are what have brought together the potential alliances that previously were scattered. So that in the 1930s and the 1940s, it was not possible for a minority of, uh, of the people who felt that there should be a national health service system the way every other Western nation uh, has finally adopted. And we have to begin by understanding that when we're sitting in Cedar Lakes, West Virginia, sort of in the heartland of small town and rural America, that we're in the largest and richest country in the world, and we're the only nation, the only large industrial or Western nation without a national health service system, which the AMA may choose to call socialized medicine, which uh, Mr. Nixon in proposing may propose national health insurance and various politicians may propose a national health service system, whatever name it goes by. We're the only nation in the world except for those nations that have not yet developed in Africa, in Asia, and in the Near East. There are no Western or Eastern capitalist, socialist, communist countries without a national health service system. So we've got to begin by getting that politics aside or else we're going to be moving in the idiocy of the debate that exists within the AMA, which is an idiot's debate from the 17th century dragged over into the 20th century. Dr. Hoffman, a new celebrated president of the AMA from Huntington, is just another <coughs> of what Shakespeare would call, you know, in the idiot stage of his development. He is talking utter nonsense. It has nothing to do with world developments or world history. So let's remove that and look calmly. We're the only country, if any one of us got off an airplane in England, you understand? No one would ask you if you needed an appendix operation, what your insurance company was, or in Yugoslavia, or in Moscow, or in Belgium, or in Copenhagen, or you name the country. You would be rushed to a hospital, and when you finished, you wouldn't get a bill. You wouldn't hear anything about it. You'd get back on the plane if you were a millionaire or a poor person, and you would come back without a bill, okay? And it would only be modified a slight amount. What I've just said, you know, in England would be zero. Some other country would say, you did this and that, you owe us 12 shillings, or you know, or 13 francs or something, but it'd be junk, like the telephone in this country, or the sales tax. Now, if we understand that, then we'll understand where we are. We only have a problem because we haven't chosen to solve it the way we solved old age pensions, unemployment compensation, workman's compensation, public education. If we were as backward in dealing with our young people's education as we are with our nation's health, we would today be a nation of illiterates. But instead, we're a highly educated nation because a hundred years ago we decided to socialize education and say that the poorest child would get an education along with the richest child and would have an opportunity for public education. But we have not said that in health, and that's the reason we're here. Now, with that background, let me bring you back to the issues. We still have to live in 1972 USA. So we have a rising health care cost, a spiral that starts and is going up, and nobody knows how to stop it. It continues Kennedy, it continues Johnson, it continues Nixon. No leveling, no plateauing, none of this. Right, but that keeps going, okay? Nobody knows where the upper right-hand corner of the graph is going to go. Now, why does that have to do with the politics of this? You think the poor people are concerned about this? No, they, they, they haven't had the care to begin with. They knew all about this problem. Who is it that's affected by this? Well, it's the middle class. Right, the working class and the middle class. You see, they've, got, they've been made ready. The poor people always knew that they couldn't get in. They couldn't get into the system. They didn't have a chance if you didn't have money. 
if you had a welfare card, you know, if you had the wrong credentials. But what is putting this on the agenda of history is that the great American working class and middle class, now I'm old-fashioned, you know, the, if there are students present, they don't talk this way anymore. Uh, these kids uh, have everything paid. There's only poor people and middle class people, which is more left-wing idiocy. You know, there's a working class. There's a great American working class. They're forgetting that. They're forgetting it in election year 1972, and a blue-collar worker doesn't think like a white-collar worker. And they better wake up to this fact, okay? So the great American working class is affected by this because they thought they bargained out and got good insurance as a steel worker or an automobile worker or somebody. Every time they take their insurance card in, they owe more money. Or it doesn't cover this or it doesn't cover that. And that's the big mass of what they call in the middle American. They're getting very angry. Then your whole middle class, your professional people, everybody but a doctor and a doctor's wife and a few of the doctors, sisters, and cousins, but even they're getting disgusted with the doctors, is affected by all this, okay? There's only a handful, really under 1%, that are not utterly disgusted with this rising cost of hospital care, of physician fees, this escalation without end, which we're going to discuss. So that's point number one, right? It's this cost thing. And that's putting people together into an alliance. And point number two is this availability. Now, what's availability mean? Suppose you're told by Dr. Hoffman or another AMA spokesman, you're lucky. You live in a country which has the finest standard of medical care in the world, the finest standard of medical education, which has extended the um, uh, longevity of its citizens, which has dealt with very serious diseases and wiped them out. And you're really lucky. Do the American people in many places feel really lucky with the, having the best doctors in the world? Well, what do you think uh, in Doddridge County? Some of you coming down here drove through Doddridge County. Uh, what if you drive through Clay County? What if you, until recently, uh, drove through uh, Gilmer County, okay? We've got somebody from Gilmer, and they can discuss this, what you do about these things. It took a lot for Gilmer to get a doctor. You'd be driving through counties without doctors, right? Took a hell of a struggle, I know, in which I was a part, to get the doctor into uh, Doddridge County. We've had, they had an on-off struggle. Got this beautiful clinic, you know, Sears Roebuck designed and built by uh, the community and paid for, but empty. No doctors in it. Uh, no doctors in the whole county of 7,000 people. Clay County, the same way, Doddridge. And there are something, several hundred such counties in the United States. How do you think people are feel with Dr. Hoffman's speech or the AMA literature? What good is it if it's not available? Now, what if you're poor? What if you live in Wheeling, Charleston, Huntington, Morgantown, Fairmont, you name it, and you're poor. Is the care available to you? See, availability is very important. Anyone want to mention what availability means? What kinds of availability? Sometimes there are no doctors. Sometimes there's one or two doctors. And can you always get in to see them? Has anyone here ever had a cool secretary over the telephone say, the doctor will see you three weeks or six weeks from next Friday, it's the first 15 minutes that's open. Huh? Well, you know, you, did, you didn't know the magic words. You were supposed to say, my chest, I have a terrible, something that's malpractice, you follow me? If you don't bring me in, it's trouble, you follow me? If you just told them, you know, my, what was the matter? It's, well, it's that hip, it's still hurting like it's rheumatism. Well, the rheumatism will keep, you see, six weeks from next Friday is early enough. That's availability question too, isn't it? How long you wait, whether you can get in, whether there's anybody to go see. What if you've got a, a mentally retarded child or somebody in your family is emotionally disturbed? What about psychiatric care in West Virginia? There are more psychiatrists in one apartment house, in one block, on Park Avenue in New York City than there are in the entire state of West Virginia. Except for the university, 
they almost don't exist except as wealthy. I think the four in Wheeling and maybe three or four in Charleston, if you've got any in Huntington, three or four, I mean, except for the cities, they don't exist. You know, even a clinic like ours has to go uh, buy one, you know, pick one up one day every two weeks, you know, or half a day, any way you can get one. Certain specialties don't exist. You're staying with me now, even if you got a doctor, you're not getting the specialty care you need. Now, how about the doctor you get? Under availability is what kind is he? Suppose I were to tell you that in West Virginia counties, Many of the reason they're not in the shape that uh, Doc, that uh, Gilmer and Clay and uh, and uh, Doddridge are in is because the doctor practicing is either between his 60 and 70th birthdays or between his 70th and his 80th birthday. That's the reason they're not at zero. So that puts them in another generation of training. That's pre-penicillin training. You understand? That a dean of, a, of one of the med schools said, he made this speech uh, to his graduating class, that if a physician graduates from a medical school, goes out into practice by himself, not in a group, not with colleagues who can criticize him, not keeping up, Within seven years in which the drug detail salesmen are his only scientific colleague encounters, he is going to prove, in his opinion, worse than no doctor at all because he won't, there's the, the learning in medicine is on such a steep grade that the dangers of side effects, like in penicillin and in other drugs, are so great that he's going to be doing things without understanding, but not keeping up with the negative effects of what he's doing. Or like the great Sir William Osler said, most of the time he used to urge his medical students, leave the patient alone, he'll heal himself. You know, it's the doctor that keeps him sick or gets him sick. From, he introduces what they call iatrogenic disease into the process, and very often this is what happened. You remember the 28 deaths of hepatitis because some guy didn't sterilize the needle. He got in one patient with hepatitis and kept given shots with the same needle, he killed 28 of his patients with hepatitis. That's, that, that, I don't know what happened to him in his malpractice insurance, but that's called iatrogenic <laughs> disease. They at least have a Latin word, you know, to cope with it, okay? Now, what has all this got to do with one more thing, okay? You watch TV? You ever watch Dr. Welby? Okay. And Dr. Kylie on the motorcycle? Okay. We got a doctor who rides a motorcycle. There's nothing wrong. You know, it's a nice image. But let's take Dr. Welby on TV. American public sit there glued. It's one of the top shows and has remained so since it came on. All right, what, what's the Dr. Welby story? And let's see how real it is from your experience. First, the waiting room. There is nobody in the waiting rooms. You ever watch, Doctor? Well, that's number one, okay? Tell me, tell me, really, maybe some of you know the reality somewhere of this Dr. Welby show. There's never anybody waiting. Never is the waiting room full. There's never anybody waiting. There's always somebody who comes in or from the car. They help him right in, and the doctor's at the desk waiting, or the sweet nurse, you know, and she brings him right out of the exam. That's point number one. There is empty waiting room. Tell me if that's true. You go to doctors, okay? Right? They never have an appointment schedule, no one in front of you, never kept waiting, never denied a service, right? Always, no waiting rooms, okay. Point two, they, he is never testy, he's never harassed, he never woke up on the wrong side in the morning, he's never a son of a bitch, as, as most of them are, and have to be tamed down. He's a godlike, sweet, concerned figure forever in this show, right? A am I not right? I mean, it's a heroic figure. No wonder there's, some, there's something like the Good Housekeeping label, isn't that? It flashes on that screen indicating the AMA is approved of this show or something. I mean, it's a, it, this doctor doesn't exist. Some of you, uh, you know, it's a dream. We all, 
it's uh, probably uh, the girl with the you know the best figure in the world. It's the uh, it's the greatest thing you you know you'd want to ever see as a doctor like this guy. Third, he and Kyle have endless hours to handle not only your diagnostic and treatment problems, but all of your personal problems, <laughs> and to meet you at airports when you're having a crisis with your wife or if your child is causing to get on the motorcycle, you know, when you've been thrown off the horse, he's coming up the road as you hit the bushes. And it goes on, okay? You've seen the show, right? And it's a beautiful storyline, beautiful writing, but no reality now, as, as I see it, and you all correct me if I'm wrong, and yet this is the path that the American public, you know, gets in the way of uh, understanding of medical care. Well, it's a good dream. It's like the Westerns, you know. We all want to ride off into the sunset with a Marlboro, you know, in our hand and be that noble thing. And the women are looking at us and we got hard lines, you know, and all this. And, uh, and I suppose that's what we all really want. We want to dream there is such medical care somewhere. Now, if those two things I said are the reality, I really believe this is not real. And I want you now to help me. I want to deal with one more thing and then I want to start on taking the establishment apart. And I want to analyze it surgically, the way they would, a surgeon would analyze his problems. We'll just take apart what is healthcare system and what are its parts and who runs it, who owns it, where the money is. From your experience. All right. Keep in mind as we do this that from Nixon on the right and the insurance industry all the way to Teddy Kennedy on the left. And those are bad words because Nixon is proposing national health insurance and Teddy Kennedy is not on the left. You know, so I'm saying from right to left only to indicate a political spectrum. And you must know that they would laugh real loud in a Labor Party meeting in England if anybody was to say Teddy Kennedy's proposal is left because it doesn't go as far as the Tory legislation of 1950 you know, uh, amending the original national health for instance, it doesn't even require anything of doctors, except that they take your money. You know, but the federals are going to pay it, so they're going to get as rich as they got under Medicare. But that's called a left-wing proposal in the idiocy of American politics, see? But suddenly, Teddy Kennedy, going further than Nixon, he simply says that they won't, the insurance industry won't get a piece of the action and won't make money, dollars on it, see? But that's then national, you know, socialized medicine or something. But what's serious is this. Ever, all of us know that Wilbur Mills or somebody down the middle is going to come out with national health insurance. And we really have to have meetings like this of the people to understand it so we don't think we're getting something that's going to be pulled out from under you because this is what happened with Medicare. The older people and the American public really thought, as they fought the AMA to a standstill and defeated them in both political parties ending in 1965, that they were getting for the older people something like the British system. Well, they got no such thing. The AMA did a beautiful holding action, and they ended up with a major piece of the action in which they, all their screams about socialized medicine were nonsense. They ended up richer than ever as fee-for-service doctors. They just were dragged unwillingly into a better system of payment. Example one under Medicare, cataract operation. You know what a cataract is on the eye? Anybody have any idea how long it takes an ophthalmologist to remove a cataract? How many hours? Anyone want to guess? Anybody got any idea? Well, huh? Okay, it, that's fair. Some of them can do it in 20 minutes. A half an hour is a, a fair amount of time. They're not all that fast. Uh, so a busy ophthalmologist now, if he doesn't start at 7, if he has enough of them scheduled, uh, even if he's loafing, you know, should be able to take off 3 a morning, 15 a week, how many a month? Cataract used to be priced under Blue Shield and most insurance policies at about $175 uh, up till Medicare. Now, around here, it's priced generally at about $440 to $500. And they charge as much as $750 in major cities like New York and San Francisco. Now, 
That's a beautiful system because Social Security doesn't want to be robbed, so they come along and allow them part of that inflation and then say, we will pay 80% of it, right? Here's this poor old person who thought the government was going to pick up the bills. And all of us so-called middle-aged people are picking up higher taxes thinking, oh, this is going to help, right? The older people are going to get something. We're going to get them when we get there, right? And all the young people don't mind. All of a sudden, you realize they used to pay 175. Well, now the doctor picks up his 325, whatever it is, you know, 80% of whatever the fee is, and he's, by the way, you owe me 175 for your 20% balance. Can you, you know, if a poor man figured out a system like that with a gun and took a six shooter and put it to your head, he'd go to jail for 20 years, right? The, jail, the penitentiaries are full of them. But if you got an education and do it all with a fountain pen and the law and with the AMA and a fee schedule, then this kind of highway robbery that enriches people who deal with one inch of the human body, see, not with a whole person, not Dr. Welby's at all, uh, go on. Then this we don't want to happen, hopefully, under a better system. So let's now do a job and examine the health care system. The word establishment is used to try to indicate who runs things. Who's the ruling service? In the health care establishment, where is the money? Somebody start in. Where's the dough? Who runs the health care establishment? Huh? Insurance company. Okay. Very important. We'll start with something. Does everybody agree they got a big piece of the action? Huh? The health insurance companies. Not all life insurance companies sell health insurance, but a great many of the biggest, wealthiest, billionaire corporations in this country sell health insurance. Then you have two categories there. You have the profit ones that we're talking about. Then what is the biggest non-profit health insurer? Right. Blue Cross Blue Shield. Okay? Now wherever big dollars are, you have to follow it. So there's a big piece of the action here in health insurance industry. Let's not remember. Do they deliver you a service? Do they deliver a health service to you personally? No. no. They are a payment mechanism, right? A financing mechanism that hold money. Big, big money, okay? We're not talking about Social Security Administration paying on to Medicare. We're talking about private dollars. Very big, billions of dollars are tied up here. Very big decision making. For instance, this industry leaning on President Nixon is insisting that anything that comes out of the House Ways and Means Committee under Wilbur Mills in national health Insurance shall give them a piece of the action. They want their 20%, like they get it out of the Pentagon. In other words, by gosh, if somebody's going to make 10 or 20%, we want ours, okay, for our stockholders. It's very important, then. They're influencing costs. They're influencing changes. They're holding up, you know, the works in a big way. This is big power. Now, if we're so far talking about insurance, now let's leave it alone, because it doesn't do anything in health care. It's not none of you here go to an insurance company to get cured, to get diagnosed, to get a treatment. Let's get to where the works is now. Where is an, another big place? What else exists in healthcare? Where's big dollars tied up in healthcare? Anyone want to venture? In facilities. What's the biggest of the facilities? Okay. What, is there any question in your mind that the hospitals tie up the biggest amount of capital? Anybody here want to argue with that and say something else ties it up? Because, you know, let's lay it on. Don't be afraid. Let's talk about it. Do you think doctor's offices are lavish at times? Big medical arts building or something? It's peanuts, really, beside a, the real dollars. The real dollars are in a hospital facility. So we agreed on that? Break it down to research hospitals. Well, yeah. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll do more. We won't go into everything. But I just, is it the ones with beds, right? And what are called general hospitals, which everyone usually has in a community, unless it's a tiny community. And then as you move into bigger and bigger circles, where specialists are located and all, you find your urban hospitals and you have to go to teaching hospitals, you know, and you have to go in. Because we're going to get down to it, okay? All right, now, your hospitals, your health insurance, your hospitals, what else has beds that are not hospitals? Yeah, okay. They go by, anybody know the technical? Yeah, extended care facilities, 
or nursing homes are moving up very big because Medicare encourages them and their cheaper cost per day and a desirable development. All right, we're going to talk now about these categories in a few minutes. Who owns them and who controls them? And let's, let's stop with here. Would you say, you know, we're going to get to doctors, okay? But let's deal with this. One other big one, your drug companies. Very important. Very important. Very important. Before we, we'll, we'll study this a while and get to your comments and talk about it before we move to the most direct, the, the wealthy part, okay? The, the doctor-patient relationship that is sacrosanct and referred to by Dr. Hoffman in each press release. So let's leave it alone. There are no doctor-patient relationships here yet, right? We're talking about the insurance industry, we're talking about its makeup. We're going to move on hospitals and discuss them and break them down. We're talking about extended care facilities and nursing homes. We're talking about the big drug companies. Now let's talk about this a few minutes. These profit-making health insurance companies, what are some of the biggest? Let's get some names out. Metropolitan. Metropolitan is very big in group health. Any more? Prudential, all right. If you stop there, let's stop there a minute. We're examining the establishment in health care. We're breaking the health insurance industry into its two component parts. And so far you've mentioned Aetna, Metropolitan, and Prudential. If you stop there and you leave out the next 30, do you have any idea of the size of these three? Their ranking? What are we talking about in relation in assets and all? Who are we talking about? Are we talking about a business that might have a West Virginian on the board, for instance, even in representation? Do you have any idea, you know, where this has to be centered? These can be centered nowhere except, you know, in Boston, in New York City, you know, for these are, this is Wall Street at its peak. And this is where big profit making health insurance is located connected with the biggest banking circles going. This is the top of the American pyramid. You know, when you get down to Ford Motor Company, it's small the peanuts almost in assets for the assets of these kind of companies. So they have enormous influence in Washington, stopping legislation, slowing up Medicare, joining the AMA alliances. Now, starting let me ask you, we put them first and put nonprofit second. Which came first in health insurance? Anybody know? Yeah, right. When do you think these people got into this business? Anybody know the year they profit making health insurance started? All right, well, let's say uh, mostly they've been in it, if you only know of them recently. The big ones went into it, but they made first, they let the, the nonprofits prove it could make money. If I'm not to make a stockholder rich, but that it would go, see? So let's talk about this. The AMA's influence was so strong that for many years, this was regarded as so dangerous that nobody attempted to insure hospitalization. And when it started, Blue Cross Blue Shield started in Texas amongst the teachers. The teachers of Texas in the Depression were able to work out arrangements at six dollars a year for total hospitalization. But we all, what do you think a hospital bedroom cost then? I mean, you know, everything was relative, right? Nobody had ever heard of a ten dollar a day hospital room yet. So, you know, the thing could be actuarially, you know, uh, afforded. You had hungry hospital administrators with empty beds. You know, a depression was on. The people who occupied the beds, half of them were farmers who couldn't pay. You know, everything else was wrong, right? Uh, 40 cent cotton was selling for six cents and uh, what's the old saying uh, six cent cotton 40 cent meat how in the hell can a poor man eat I mean this was the middle of the depression when this was worked out okay Blue Cross Blue Shield then went like a prairie fire over the country because people responded it was a non-profit solution all that means is that the people who ran it and sat on its board did not make a personal profit like you would buy stock in a corporation like this. And during all the 30s, no commercial insurance company would write a policy or touch it. 
Then what do you think gave the whole movement its thrust and brought them into it after this thing went big? Was collective bargaining, the workers. What happened was, during the war, you heard about a wage price freeze now? Don't anybody laugh, right? Because wages are frozen, on little people especially, and prices, as everybody knows, are you go where they want to, especially meat and food prices. So there is no, but in World War II, which some of you aren't old enough to remember, there was honest to God wage price control. Okay. That was everything. It was frozen. There wasn't any motion. And the organized workers could only win. Their wages were frozen by running around the end and getting fringe benefits, you see? So they began forcing the employer to buy them, you know, untaxed uh, health insurance. And this boomed this. Then came the big health and welfare funds and, you know, all the big unions after the 46, 48, you know, business and everybody was getting organized. And this thing boomed and in came all in. See, there were now dollars, right? Now there's big dollars. Walter Ruth, there's steel, all every industry is organizing and, and uh, there's dollars to buy health insurance. And this thrust took along the middle class and the individuals, you know, and everything else. The collective bargaining wage freeze on the collective bargaining union effort pushed it over and then it went and everybody got into it. That's its history. Now who runs these? Any question in your mind that big money runs this one? The big mules in Wall Street. No West Virginians even make it up there. Forget about it, okay? West Virginia bankers is a small fry. You know, you don't make any of this league. How is this one run? This is local, right? We got one in Charleston, we got one in Wheeling, Blue Cross Blue Shield. But they're usually established. How did they begin? What is Blue Cross and what is Blue Shield? Will you tell me the difference? Uh, this is the hospital side, and this is the doctor side. Okay. Now, Blue Cross was the hospital side, so what they formed was a nonprofit corporation of hospital administrators. That's pretty nice, isn't it? And if he gets his, I want mine, says the pathologist. Well, the pathologist gets his, and, you know, the surgeon wants his. And then the, everything, every, the fee changes always goes on back scratching, see? That is still the way West Virginia is run. Let me assert that here, and if there's somebody from Blue Cross Blue Shield, I hope they'll correct me, okay? That's still exactly the way it's run with one amendment in West Virginia. They can't get away with it in most places in the United States. They realize the public says, how can you just deal with yourself? You need somebody else on the board. They said, you're right. We do need the public on the board. So what do you think they did? Anybody got any idea how they got them on? They added doctors to the Blue Cross board, and they added hospital administrators <laughs> and trustees to the Blue Shield board. Okay? And, and you tell me if I'm wrong. Go back home, because I may be wrong. Maybe in hunting somewhere I don't know about. But in Wheeling, is a perfect example of this, and it controls that whole area in, from Wheeling to Elkins, this whole belt across here, this northern belt. And this is exactly what the boards consist of. Is that consumers in there anywhere? See, I mean, it's just a case of, oh, you want the public? We'll give you the public, see? In fact, if you demand it enough, they'll put a doctor's wife on, or they put the, some cousin somebody on, okay? That's still the way the health insurance industry works. There is no consumer input. Now, let's get, we need some room to expand this hospital part. How about hospitals? Has every, is everyone in this room, and I know, I just want to isolate out where they're not. Where, who will raise their hand who's from a county without a hospital? Okay. See, Gilmer County, which has just fought and probably will be discussed tomorrow, and won and organized, a community organized, to get medical services, doesn't have bed services. It may have some holding beds, you know, or something. But no, no real licensed hospital beds. But everyone else is from where there's a hospital. How many of you are from towns, let me see your hand, where there's more than one hospital, there's competing hospitals in your West Virginia towns? Okay. All right, that would include uh, Huntington, Morgantown, uh, you know, huh? 
and wherever. Some point, is that in Kentucky or? Oh, okay. In other words, in Morgantown, there are three hospitals. So look, we ought to take some time and talk about it a few minutes, okay? And then you'll have to figure it out in your town. Let's take Morgantown. So we study the different kinds of hospitals in that. First of all, are there profit-making hospitals? No. You don't think so? Okay. Well, one there are, but what's the difference? If up here, they are dominant, right? And they are very big, Blue Cross Blue Shield, which we wiped out here. When you get down here, profit is a small percent. We'll get to them in a few minutes. But they're not, most hospitals are not profit making. Can we agree on that? Or does someone want to argue now? Feel free now to bang away. Okay. What do you, anyone want to add? Let me hear you. Excuse me. What? You want to say, you, you're not sure whether, oh, you're meaning when they call themselves non-profit, are they really non-profit? That's what you want to say. All right, I want to get your question clear. Your number one here is the hospital corporation, this kind of. Yeah, now, it, are, if there's somebody here from Beckley, we'll talk about Beckley. Anybody here from Beckley, somebody registered, but they may be arriving tomorrow from Beckley. You know, Beckley is a good example of, of a, it's a better example in Morgantown, to tell you the truth, because we, we could deal with Morgantown by just throwing in a university hospital into anybody's, uh, you know, complex and, and look at it. So let's take a look at the thing. Under nonprofit, in Beckley, for instance, the newest hospital is owned by Hospital Corporation of America. You look at the New York and the Wall Street Journal and you decide to buy shares in it and you, you, if it's making a buck, you're going to be making a buck. Every time that doctor puts somebody to bed, a, for all you know, very likely he owns 10,000 shares and it's in his direct immediate interest to put you in bed. And when the administrator posts a little sign, now this is the profit making hospital, not your question, okay? You're raising a question mark down here, question mark, okay? I'm saying there's a small percentage, but the evil, so to speak, in my opinion, of an openly profit-making hospital is rather apparent, you follow me? That if a doctor can buy shares of stock in a hospital and not only bill you for services, and maybe you do or don't need the surgery and bill you for that, and maybe you do or don't need to stay in bed the extra 12 days, but on top of that, be making money on his investment at the same time. Now you're at the board. This is no more Dr. Welby, sweet goodness and light, right? Now we've moved into a, a, a different uh, ball game. Now, so we're talking now about profit, and, and Beckley's a good example, but let's talk about most American hospitals. Most U.S. hospitals are non-profit. What kinds of non-profit? Let's break them down. A, B, what kinds? What kinds of people are there? Church. Oh, church. Don't churches? I mean, you, you know, you've heard of all, you know, St. This, St. That, different Catholic hospitals. You've heard of uh, various uh, Union Protestant hospitals, you, you know, in uh, Clarksville, huh? Governmental. All right, next is governmental units. How many governmental units own hospitals? They're non-profit. The county. Give me an example of a county hospital. Huntington. Huntington has one? All right, who, who else comes from somewhere with a county hospital? Monongalia County Hospital. Okay, what else besides a county can own a hospital? Huh? A city. Any city-owned hospitals here? State. Fairmont, yeah, right. With state. Fairmont General is a city-owned hospital. Where's a state hospital? Huntington State. Huntington State. Okay. Fairmont Emergency, the one down at Welch. Okay. There's state general hospitals, huh? Hopemont is a specialized state hospital. Weston is a specialized state hospital. But even general hospitals like Fairmont Emergency and at Welch, where you could go in with flu. You could go in, you see, with something besides 
like at Hopemont, they'd be taking chest diseases, right? For the most part. Or now, they, I think it's more like extended care. It used to be. They changed it over. At Weston, it would be only what kind of patients? Mental patients. You see, it's specialized hospitals. And then there are the general states. Then who else owns hospitals? Huh? Private, non-profit. Yeah, but what's, we're on government. What are the government units? Yeah, the, the feds. What do they own? VA. Very big chain of federal hospitals. VA. What else do the federals own? that's very big. The U.S. Public Health Service hospitals, we don't have them here, but in Staten Island and in Norfolk and in Frisco and, you know, different parts of, well, merchant seamen traditionally since 1793 get prepaid care. The oldest prepaid medical care program in this country is run by the United States Public Health Service. They give them free medical care, groups of doctors in the hospitals and the hospitals, like in Norfolk and Staten Island. Okay, that's the feds, okay? Now, private nonprofit. There's another word, I won't confuse you, the more technical word they use more customarily is a voluntary. You know, like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, people come together in a voluntary way, but it means private, right? It's non governmental. And they run it how? Nonprofit. Then we have a lady here, and I hope she'll elaborate. Did you want to add to this, Drew? I was going to say, there is a true private. We have two of them in Huntington. That's not profit. That are not profit. And that are private. Oh, hold it. Oh, now, now, now we're talking about two kinds of profit. No, no. And there's MD proprietaries up here. And there's stockholding private. But they... In Charleston, you have them too. I, this eye hospital in Charleston, owned by the doctors who put you to bed there. That's their thing. Okay. But they happen to have the board happens to be MDs. Well, you'd have to. Let, let's put it this way. Do any of you know? We we'll back up to number one, so we stay clear. There are profit-making hospitals like Hospital Corporation of America, which owns five or six in Nashville and is just building in Beckley, bought the Beckley Hospital, is that not correct? And are enlarging it. Uh, and they just bought the one down at, uh, who knows the place, Ronsiford, or somewhere in there, right? They just bought that hospital. They, they're going all around the country buying up hospitals, okay? That is profit making, right? They make a profit on every admission, on every bed. Well, they lose money, right, if they're stupid, but they try to cut costs and make money. MD proprietary is something else. In California, 10% of the hospitals are MD proprietary. And some of those are incorporated now and let other people buy stock. But they began essentially as a bunch of doctors who decided we not only give the community a hospital, we make money on it. All over southern West Virginia, I believe the hospital in Logan is MD proprietary. I believe the hospital in Mullins is owned by the doctors, huh? Bluefield Sam. Bluefield Sam, I think, is owned by the doctors in the group down there. That's a money-making group who also own the beds. We clear on that? They're like doubling up on you, okay, in making money. Down here on nonprofits, we still haven't gotten to this lady's point. We're going to keep that a mystery for a minute. There are church-owned hospitals of all types, aren't they? I mean, in big cities sometimes, uh, and let's take Pittsburgh. Uh, Presbyterian University, you know, has a huge, the next the largest one is Montefiore, the next largest one is St. Francis. I mean, you have every denomination, you see, with a, another hospital, right? And you've seen that when you go into other big cities. Church hospitals are a very important component of the nonprofit sector. The government is a very important operator of hospital beds. And then the private, voluntary, nonprofit. We're not talking about this one. Uh, anyone want to give me examples where it's not a church, but where a community... Uh, what is Preston Memorial? Is that owned by the county or is that operated just by a board there? Do you know? It's, uh, county, I think. That's county, huh? Uh, I think the county courthouse has a tab, you know. The well, then that sounds like county. Uh, but there are this type... The hospital in Martinsburg. The hospital in Martin. It's called City Hospital, but it has nothing to do with the city. It's I nonprofit, see. Yeah. voluntary, uh, 
Ownership. Ownership, ownership as well as board. Okay. Sometimes, like in Fairmont, the city owns it, but allows eight or nine wealthy people to run it. That's different. The, you know, you get there. We'll talk about what you can do about that. See. You have your uh, uh, fraternal organization, Shriners. Right. 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 There. Are, this is a group that's real. Okay. Now we've got the three categories, and we're ready for our comment. So why don't you? You said question mark. Do you want to question mark all of them? Since this is most hospitals, what are you questioning? Because I want to get the point. Whether they really serve the public when they're nonprofit? Or they are going out for profit, yeah. Or do you mean that the board personally makes a profit? I want to be sure I understand what your point is on these nonprofits. I am not even very sure, and I'm just talking of the board. I probably okay. talk of the whole structure. Yeah. Well, Miss White may want to talk about the board. There's a number of people here. Let me explain by jumping. Let me give you an example of corruption inside of this and see if that will not be better than meaning question mark, are they nonprofit? I think they're nonprofit. Follow me? Unless someone wants to argue that. In other words, there is no question in my mind, that's me and my prejudices, you have yours, okay, that this is worse up here. This shadow land is evil, okay, where doctors own it or stockholders own it. And that this is better, not because it's better in your town or county, but because if there's something wrong, you can expose it to the light of day and possibly win. You follow me? You can do something about it. You tell me what you can do, you know, uh, you know, with Ford Motor Company, you follow me? So you pick at the stockholders meeting. You know, what do you do with them, really? They own the thing. It's theirs. You can hardly win that fight, is my question. At the point. Go ahead. Well, I don't know. Yet at the same time, they are out to go, uh, they are out to go for profit. They are operating for fun. And they are open about that. Right. And yet at the same time, you are saying that we are operating on a non-profit type of thing. Uh, right. What I'm trying to drive at is, um, you know that they are there for profit, and they are open about it. And yet at the same time, you seem to uh, uh, accept the fact that they are there to operate on a non-profit, and yet you are doubtful. Are they really out there well, to serve? And or these not? two hospitals I was referring to in Huntington do have doctors on the boards. They are private non-profit corporations. But the stop the uh, incorporated the board the corporate board are entities and who practice in those hospitals and they do not get a corporate profit but they get a salary increase in accordance with the receipts from their practice. Sounds. Are you familiar with these? What would be the category? Where would they be in the AHA categories? Do you know? Because the AHA would usually, if it's MD proprietary, not allow it to appear no, down here. Non Huh? Private They're private nonprofit, but she's describing a deal under which they bleed off the pro some money from it. Is that right? So they can okay. Yeah. All right. Now I'm getting your point. You're you're in. Are you meaning the same type of thing, or do you mean a? All right. Let's talk about that. That is certainly a corrupt arrangement, right? We just heard a corrupt arrangement where doctors are able to bleed off if the hospital makes a million dollars, take off ten thousand pieces. Of, okay. Anyone want to comment? All right, but, yeah. Maybe the point that I'm trying to make in addition to this is that although some people, some organizations go under the name of non-profit, yes. uh, a doctor, for example, may charge $5 for his service when in fact his services are really only worth $2, yet he is making a $3 profit by charging the additional $5. This is the type setup I think that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'm talking about where in one case, in one hospital, the members of the family incorporated, of this doctor, incorporated. He is the doctor who practices in the hospital. As the receipts of the hospital increase, so does his salary paid him by the corporation. This, I would still say, and, and let's, let, let me just make a few different points and you respond to what you're saying now. Tactic. In this area, you can bring lawsuits successfully. In this area, you can expose them to the light of day in newspapers. You know, in other means, and change. But you can't get no, I'm not. 
more difficult in here, but down in here, especially. You know, or suppose a church hospital or a private voluntary is allowing doctors, you know, to bleed off money. They, they certainly, they either are violating their internal revenue service standards, there's something wrong, you follow me, that you can do something about it. They're violating their own charter. They're violating their own bylaws about nonprofit. Up in here, would you all not agree, what are you to do about it, you follow me? This is a dangerous trend and is growing. Once, when Beckley goes that way, you follow me? Let's take Beckley. You've got Appalachian Regional Hospital, its largest hospital in its chain is there, nonprofit. There's no question in my mind that there's a tremendous difference between Appalachian Regional Hospital in Beckley and the Beckley Hospital now owned by, is it Raleigh General? I forget, there's three there. Be oh no, I, I know what it is now. There's three hospitals in Beckley. Two are proprietary. Beckley has the Appalachian Regional Hospital, its largest 200-bed hospital. It has Beckley Hospital and it has Raleigh General. Now, one of these is owned was owned by Dr. Tish. Anybody now getting close to politics? Want to finish that sentence? Which means that Hewlett Smith, ex-governor of West Virginia, is the major stockholder in one of these. I forget which is which. And the other was just purchased by Hospital Corporation of America of Nashville, which is an open stockholder. So one is held by closely held stock you cannot buy, from the Tisch family. I think the governor married a Tisch daughter, which means that all the sons and daughters and the in-laws own all the stock, okay? Just like a privately small corporation. And the other is owned now by Hospital Corporation of America. Now, is there any question as to what's happened in Beckley and which is worse in Beckley? I mean, compared, you know, that Appalachian Regional Hospital, you know, is a blessing to have in Beckley under these circumstances because you've gone proprietary. Like Morgantown, not a single one of those three hospitals is proprietary. We'll talk about their problems. They got big problems for the people. West Virginia University, the biggest in Morgantown. You got Montague General, belongs to the county. And you got Vincent Pilati, which belongs to a church order. Okay, that's the three hospitals. And now let me give you one more example of another kind of corruption. And Ms. White may want to add something here. Fairmont General Hospital is owned by who? Owned by the city. The city owns it. Does the city board of directors run it? Is that its policy in any way? Huh? Not, not really. Who runs it? They have a lot no of huh? They have a board. They have a board, but it's full of doctors. No, no. not doctors. Oh, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The social uh, it's club. Fairmont Field Club. And who is Fairmont Field Club? Established. Yeah, Fairmont Field Club bars anyone who back for three generations has any, well, let's not talk about Negroes and Jews, has any Italian, Polish, <laughs> Ukrainian. The bylaws go on and list about 30 nationalities. You have to, to be eligible to pay your dues, prove that not. Any gen anywhere in the third, three generations back, do you have any one of these Southern or Eastern European nationalities? Catholics are questionable. Right. Catholics are very questionable because while Irish are not mentioned, it was at least uh, for 30 years they kept out, you know, any Irish from the uh, field. So, 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 so now that's where they get their board. Follow me? It's all businessmen, bankers, consolidation coal. Uh, you know, et cetera, okay? You forgot one form. That when one member gets off, another member of the family takes his seat. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. When, uh, when for instance, uh, Dollison of the box factory gets too old to serve, then young Dollison is appointed. And that is a city-owned hospital. That's another kind of corruption, right? I'm still saying there's something wrong with us in politics if we can't use the leverage before that city board of directors to shame them about, you know, taxpayers picking, you know, yeah, paying for... Yeah, your question at this point. Yeah. Uh, is this hospital uh, subsidized by Hill Burton? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and all this was laid before. It has Hill Burton money. It just built the most modern northern West Virginia $10 million building. It has HUD money. 
And, and when Mr. Weaver headed HUD, and when the present appointee, Romney, headed it, they all had all these facts set in front of them. The bars against blacks, against Jews, against Italians, against Poles, against, you know, 30 nationalities from the field club brought over. They also bar all blue-collar workers in the best organized union labor town. And they will not allow a single labor person on that board. They won't allow a single woman on their board. And all this was laid before the Federals, and they, they, you know, appreciated the information. They sent in investigators, and they kept pouring it in until they got $10 million. That's, 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 that's right. No, no, no. Spiro would never make it. Okay. Not the cabinet. The vice president would not make it. I'm sorry to say he'd be sent back to a restaurant, but he would not make it on their board. Uh, all right, what are we talking about then? Can, can the nonprofits sometimes be pretty establishment oriented? Huh? Is there any question in your mind with all the evidence we're getting in from different ways? Uh, I think there are leverages. There have been enormous changes in the VA hospitals, you know, the social character for the good, a certain openness has come, you know, with, but popular boards and consumer input, I don't think so much to you all in, in terms of your own experiences. Uh, uh, I was going to suggest that uh, there's no set rule actually for running a hospital like you get inside of it, except uh, what the administrator wants. And this is actually my doctor, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Or, you're, you're, well, in most hospitals you have a board setting policy. Now you don't in these governmental hospitals. They're run by a book, you know, a federal book, a, a black book of orders, you know, that, that's out in any big uh, organization. Uh, well, but I'm most of the church... You know, there are too many uh, different uh, ways that they manage it from that black book. You know, why some are better, some are fair, and some are just some stretch the point a little more than others. Mm -hmm. Well, That's why I say so. you, are you saying that even if you've got a good board, they might not be able to have say so? Is that what you're saying? Even if the consumers? Your medical what? staff has a great deal of what uh, yeah, is to say about the operation. Is there any question about that? The medical staff have big bargaining power. If the and buildings raise their bargaining power, it's no staff. wonder they have bargaining power. Huh? Well, and it's at the country club that the medical staff has great influence over their members of their board. I mean, they're all well, close friends and work together socially, right? Well, is it true then that sometimes, even when you have a big community board, that they may be, as Ms. Brown suggests, the kind of people who are associating socially and intermarrying with the doctors so that not much has to be said to be running it like locked together in a, there's, there's in a way. There's also a factor of accreditation for hospitals too, isn't there? What, what is a factor in accreditation? Well, doesn't the AOA have a role in accrediting hospitals? Yeah, except that there's new, the reason I'm speaking to some of this point of leverage is that accreditation has been opened up to the public more. Did you follow me? There are progressive influences beginning to be exercised. The hearing was held in Washington as to whether unless consumers have a say-so on the boards of hospitals, questioning whether, you know, accreditation can really be given to the hospital if it's unrepresentative of the community on its board, so that there are already we're taking AMA and American Hospital Association, AHA devices, and turning them around. They've become semi-public devices. The minute you get public devices, in my opinion, you have a chance. Up in here, this is evil. Like in California, the California people like us in a meeting almost right off, 10% of their hospitals. We don't have to do that. There's not that big a number of beds lost. When they go this road, you better know they're going to make a buck on their beds. You better, you can't meet with their administrator. You've got nothing to say to them. They, they're cost cut. The job of an administrator in that hospital is to cut costs and make dollars. The stockholders that he's fired and replaced. Down in here, you can find some humane administrators. You can find some humane board members. 
You can find some humane department heads whom you can work with. You follow me? The minute it's all profit, you follow me? It's not power, it's not anything, it's just dollars. It means he has to see there are less nurses on duty at night, no matter how sick the people are. It means he doesn't want an emergency room. You don't make money on an emergency room. He wants to get rid of OB because that fluctuates up and down with pills and too many damn things. What he wants is a surgery. He wants the fast turnover. He doesn't want the big neurosurgery. He wants that into the university. In other words, he's laying out just what he wants, where he makes a buck in admissions. You see, and, and unless you sit in a town like Beckley's going to see, <coughs> at Beckley in the way I presented it there, I really see, I wish those people, you know, were here tonight that had registered to come, because I think their town is not facing up to the issues. They're still bickering over old-fashioned issues while the hospitals, two out of three, are being taken over by profit-making, you know, interests and endangering all of medical care. What else can be done down in here? Does anyone? Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I think you're giving a message which I don't agree with. Yeah. And that is that you can't make any changes in profit-making hospitals. And I agree it's hard to do, and it's, hard, it's yeah. probably harder than non-profit. But I, there are tactics that have been used against industry that have succeeded. Ralph Nader's doing some of them now. Saul Linsky did it against Kodak. I'll buy that. Kodak yeah. and that type of thing. Uh, would you buy it's more difficult? That's, uh, maybe that's the only point I ought to make, and, and not the, you know, shading out of it. It's more difficult to deal up here than it is here. We haven't even got to the one I want to discuss for a few minutes as soon as we hear that man out in the back, which is West Virginia University Medical Center. Go ahead. Don't profit-making hospitals have to meet the center accreditation standards? As a both of them have to, they both can be accredited if they choose to be. They don't have to be. No hospital has to be accredited. But it has become a status symbol, and they're afraid it might become a Medicare or National Health Insurance symbol. So they're afraid of it. They want to be accredited. Does the AMA have some sort of ruling that a member of the AMA cannot practice it? Or no, 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 no. Let me separate out accreditation. Accreditation. Do you all understand what it means? Smaller hospitals. I don't think all of you follow this, right? Don't be afraid to just say, you know, break it down or something. Anytime we're getting into something technical. Most American hospitals are accredited. They have met certain minimal standards and are accredited. And accreditation is by a joint commission on accreditation of hospitals. The JC. AH stands for Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals. The AMA, if you don't know what any of these initials are, just say break it down and shout something out, okay? American Hospital Association, the American College of Physicians, American College of Surgeons. Nobody even smiled. That's like rabbit stew, one horse and one rabbit. You all didn't catch on. I pulled it on you. And I listed it and y'all didn't get it, did you? There's four groups in it, right? They're each allowed, let's say, three delegates. So who arrives? Just look at it, huh? Any of you going to get there under that? Okay. AMA is going to send three doctors, right? I just told you, it's rabbit stew and you missed it. They're going to send three hospital administrators, right? Who is the American College of Physicians? Three more doctors from the AMA. Who's the American College of Surgeons? Three more doctors from the AMA. Any question who's going to run that show? Well, they Nine don't, doctors, right? And three. They don't make any claim to have consumer input. No, they don't pretend. But there have been some hearings held to do it. Now, the question the is... is like the good housekeeping yeah. seal of approval. That's all it is. It's a seal of approval. Mm -hmm. uh, now, first of all, a small hospital can't make it. I want to try to answer your question because I think more people here don't understand it, you know, would like to understand it than are saying so. A small hospital doesn't even apply. They well, can't cut the mustard. Yeah. We're a small hospital. Well, how many days? Uh, 75, 85. Where are you located? Come on, where are you located? Logan County. Where, what hospital? Are you, at, are you at Man, or which one are you at, Man? Yeah. You're at Man. Are you part of the ARH chain? Yeah, the Appalachian Regional Hospitals is progressive and would insist that every, the tiniest hospital in their chain get in. 
but a, 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 an ordinary small hospital very often will pass it up, like a, a, a 20, 25 bed, you know, tiny hospital. It's like too much trouble. Your lab has to meet certain standards. You have to have a certain amount of lead shielding in your x-ray. You follow me? It's more than even the law. And uh, you have to have a full-time nurse, you know, on each shift. From the, the, if they come around, you got a PN, or, uh, you know, uh, you're in trouble. All LPN, all the stuff. For all these reasons, which I don't want to elaborate because there are some sloppy things in the JCAH too. For instance, Fairmont General Hospital doesn't even own an EKG. They allow the private doctors to bring in their own EKG machines and privately take EKGs. Well, JCAH is out of the 18th century. They all insist, you know, on that hospital having its own technician and, you know, own machine, but they don't. They, they still get a two-year accreditation every two years. So it's a seal of approval, just like Ms. Brown said, in my opinion. You know, I mean, and many hospitals pass it up. Some of these very big money-making hospitals are accredited. You don't have to be non-profit. Now, the VA is just like Appalachian Regional. It insists, you know, that its hospitals do it. The public health service ones do. Most I rose, but I always used to say that was that Scott's run, you know, was one mile from the University of, and that, that Department of Sociology for 50 years, didn't know what was going on, Scott's run. Well, maybe now the sociologists have found out what's going on, maybe the doctors don't know what's going on. See, it's a, you know, an area of poverty and elderly people, you know, and working class people, ex-coal mine towns and so forth. still not sure Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. What, uh, what, let me examine, and, and what, what could a university do? Suppose Gilmer County had problems. Suppose Gilmer County locked, lacked a doctor. Should that have been a concern of the university? It sat in the middle of the state. Honestly, how do you all feel as taxpayers, as, as people? You're concerned. Would it be huh? Should it have been concerned? Well, let's say that, that the chairman of the Department of Preventive Medicine was concerned. Let's say that he visited Gilmer County repeatedly. And let's say that he tried to do certain things. Should he then have been backed up by his faculty colleagues, do you think, at the university? You know, other professors of medicine? Historically, they don't match necessarily. Okay. Well, do you think he should have been backed up by the vice president, or the president, in saying, well, we, we are concerned. A county without any doctors, you know, uh, not uh, 200 miles away, and, and has come to us for help, as they did. Because, you see, the frustrations that uh, Mr. Hunter just described in Osage, a mile away, were, were repeated over the last few years in a number of places. The community of Blacksville, about 20 to 25 miles out, came in and repeatedly said there's no doctors in the area. And several departments, I believe pediatrics, psychiatry, and preventive medicine were in favor of seeing that the residents, they have 100 and, what, 25 or 50, 100, 125 to 150 uh, salary doctors, you know, up there who can be rotated. They can pretty much do what they want to in Boston. They send them out into the ghetto, you know, in New York they send them out, in, in Kentucky they send them into rural areas. You can do a lot to, you know, rotate fourth year students who are able to render services, to rotate interns, to rotate residents out. Uh, they didn't serve Blacksville just as they didn't serve Osage. They didn't respond to uh, Gilmer County, unless I'm wrong, I mean Dr. Nolan did, but never would they sit down and organize an organized program for rotation. You know, say a resident every three months in there to, that would get some experience in this fashion. And uh, this has been notoriously the history of the University of Morgantown. Now, that's a negative picture. Does anyone want to quarrel with it or well, paint a positive many, picture? How many graduates, what percentage of graduates <coughs> of WGU stay in the state of practice? It's a low percentage, but there are some. That let me comment in all fairness what the problem is. The, uh, the building took its first teaching, it opened the teaching hospital in 60, graduated its first class in 63, 
And this is 72. Now, it isn't fair yet. It sounds like, you know, we're saying they move as slow as geology. The reason it isn't fair, though, is that if a doctor finishes, and that was a handful, 64 was the first full class in 65. You know, they only had like 28 or 33 the first year. And they're only up to about 60 for most years now, and they're taking in about 72 maybe a, a freshman class now. Now, the problem is when they finish, they need a year of internship. The war was on, they went to the military for two years. That's one year, that's two. Do most doctors become GPs? Huh? What percentage become GPs? Anybody know? Why not? What percentage become specialists? 50%? 60%? What percentage? Huh? 75. Any bidders? Anyone bid, bid it up? Quitting? 75 has it? Okay, you're getting closer. The last count is, is 85 and rising, okay? Uh, percent become doctors. And of the 15 or 13 or 12 percent that become GPs, they're not usually available for your community. They're becoming GPs to go back and take daddy's practice or something. You follow me? They're, they're extremely limited as to what their goals are. Are they going Peace Corps? Are they going missionary? Or, uh, they're not coming to your little uh, Doddridge County setting. They, it's going to be war to get one into where you want them, okay? They, they, they knew what they were doing a long time ago. This is where the substantial percentage of doctors are going. So you got one year of internship, two years of military, and about three to six years of residency. Take a thoracic surgeon. We produce more damn thoracic surgeons than we need, obviously, and probably enough for the whole world. Because they become general surgeons first four years. See, one, two, down here they take four general surgery and usually two of thoracic. That's six, eight, nine. That guy hasn't gotten out yet, you follow me? He's coming, okay? Give him, give him time, okay? Nobody stays in the womb longer than doctors. I mean, this is the problem. This is their immaturity. This is everything about it. Wait, Mike, before you raise that all, yeah. let me go back to the number of graduates. Why just 64? Why just 64? Why don't they take in more? Okay. Um, this is a big, we're having fun here, and I don't know that you all aren't raising enough issues for 10 seminars, as you know. You want to tell them one of the reasons if you're in medical care for how, what the limits are and how many can be trained in anything? Uh, no. Uh, I was going to uh, <laughs> suggest that uh, maybe if they became more service oriented, maybe they'd come out of there a little sooner. Uh, you mean they would, they uh, in both ways would come out? Yes, if, uh, well, if the hospital served the community like it could. I mean, uh, you wouldn't have to, uh, uh, Gilmer County wouldn't have to have made this application. They would have known about the problem. And they would have sent help if it had been uh, service orientated. I, I believe that. So, uh, believe what that. I'm saying, if they would have to get out there and get some practical experience, uh, come out of the right. womb, then uh, I don't think they yeah. would stay in there and keep other people well, out. Well, it's a little like this, and it, it's a parallel like perhaps that it is meaningful and perhaps it isn't. If there were not a racist history in our country, then we wouldn't have to have courses in black history and black culture. If we had treated Africa and blacks properly, we wouldn't be having to specialize to do it. You follow me? It would have been part of what everybody learned. If the medical schools had ever amounted to a hill of beans in facing into the community, they wouldn't have to have departments of community medicine. See, that's the token department, you follow me? The whole damn university is going to go right down the line making a buck and running its little clinics and looking internally. So over here they set up a little department, right? With a chairman, a couple of low-paid professors, no money, a few secretaries. That's our department of preventive and community medicine. In my mind, if the whole damn place faced out, you wouldn't need it, you know? You see what I mean? And maybe it's a bad parallel, but I think it, it has some meaning that if you, if you had cared to begin with, you wouldn't have the issue, you see, of now of 
why doesn't your Department of Community Medicine get treated like your Department of Surgery with respect and face out to these problems? The whole place ought to face out. Help Preston, help everybody. But who furnishes the money for all these years of, of college? Uh, they have to Good come point. from families who have the money and they're eliminating the poor class. Oh, you're so right. They don't let them go into the medical. You know, could we do one thing? Could we do one thing? We got to turn the board over and go into MDs, okay? <laughs> And you are just saying some beautiful things, but we've got to take these guys apart from beginning to end. Yes. So could we, before we dissect them, speak of this again as a facility and how it ought to face out as an institution and whether it ought to be concerned about the people who make it possible with their taxes and with their power, you know, and their thrust. And, and that type of thing. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't know about the medical school, but I know most of the, the professors at the university, when they sign a contract, it states in there they'll spend one-third of their time teaching, one-third research, and one-third community service. And that, you know, is, is the part where professors are supposed to be out, you know, helping communities work on their problems. Yeah, but when do they do that one-third field work? Uh, yeah. When do it, they do it? And where called. do they do it? No, well, let me, let me explain. Yeah. All university teaching centers have what is called the triangle. It, it, whether it's in the contract or not, John, you've made the point. There's, and the one-third is more important. They're supposed to have three goals, teaching, research, and service. Okay? And if I say that's why it's TS, you know, in army terms, <laughs> the reason is that that's the order it comes in. See, mm -hmm. T, R, and the S is the tail of the dog. The they, well, they don't get around to the service. Very the S long. is servants. Okay, so that's beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay, they can survey you today. They go they out and survey. You okay. can dock in and right. have their field work. Now, is this true? I want to go, I, I, I don't want to, you know, we're working WBU over, but I want to really say this. We're not trying to be revolutionary here and say that they're to do something that nobody else is doing, that we're dreaming of. I think we're asking them to meet a standard that's been met in many parts of this country, which is that in the last five to ten years, many of the major teaching centers have faced out and said, we owe the community something. We have to do something for the community. Let me give you some examples. Tufts University in Boston, one of the finest neighborhood health centers funded by OEO is the Tufts Mississippi Delta Service. Tufts University in Boston founded that thing in the middle of the civil rights fight, in the middle of the black community. It has an all-black board in the middle of plantation country. When you visit there, it's like uh, you know, you're moving down the line, the cotton rows run with tractors as far as your eye can see for 10 miles, you know, out to the horizon. And there in the middle of it is this beautiful center, neighborhood health center, run by the people of that area with Tufts University support, you know, muscling it up in doctors, sending out residents. Meharry Medical College in Nashville, the Black Medical College sends down surgical residents. In other words, they don't allow them to just stay in Nashville and to stay in Boston. They say, part of your four years, and they could do this, I'm saying. In other words, and it's part of the answer to the, to, uh, the point in Gilmer County. What is the point? That if you've got a man for four years, say, in, in internal medicine and cardiology, he could have a beautiful experience spending six months of it learning in Gilmer. All they need to do is have the decency to say to assign one professor down on Monday to be with him, another one on Thursday, the rest of the time, you know, so he gets some supervision. We do this in Fairmont for two schools of podiatry, for externs from Yale. You just put them under supervision, but they, we see that they go to Farmington, they go to Shinston, they do something in rural communities. And we're tiny and we're without resources. They've got all these resources. But you've got to care about whether you're going to face rural. And they're not caring about the rural availability problem. 
It's not just Gilman. If only it's a case of facing out into all these areas if they care. And I think all we're asking them to do is do what the big New York, Philadelphia, and other hospitals are doing. They're sending their kids into the inner city ghettos. They're staffing these places. We're saying your problem in West Virginia is go out and staff the rural counties. Um, I definitely think that doctors and medical centers should look out into the community, but I think you're you're not really going into it deep enough. You, like, for instance, you mentioned the Tel Delta Project, like a, a fairy tale story. Well, they had you know years of trouble before they got that going. They're still having trouble now. Um, was funding a lot of internal political things, even though it's a very good example. And, and I think that you're making the thing too simplistic when you just say, tell the universities to turn around and look out. It would be helpful to me if you go a little bit more into how, other than saying just send out some doctors and some professors, because there's much more um, to it than that. And the other thing I'd like to add about the big more than universities is one reason that they are going into the ghettos and going out is not because they have any great interest, but because the hospitals they work in, they have so many doctors in school that can't get enough experience there. And they're going out for their own experience, or at least that's at least 50% of it, not because of any great um, wish, except on the part of a few, to help the people in the ghetto or other poverty areas. So I, you know, I just think you should look at some of the motives on the other side of the coin not just gloss over it. I think that's good. We, uh, th there's none of these going to be simple. I mean, there's inner struggles going to exist inside of any kind of progress. I, 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 I think I was simply saying there was a consensus here, perhaps I, that no one knows of any way in which West Virginia University is facing out as, say, Lexington, Kentucky is. I, I'm not making a hero out of it. If anybody's here from Kentucky, they do have field professors stationed in eastern Kentucky. I mean, uh, I don't want to make a dream world. Maybe they, they have more problems than uh, Tufts does, you know, in, in the Delta. But my God, there are field professors who stay down in Harlan. And there are residents who come through Harlan, you know, and come through the coal mining county. Now, that's all. I mean, there's none of this in West Virginia. We've got to somehow move the thrust over, even though we're going to have problems, and even though a lot of what you say is true, what the motivation may be. I think they have the problem, for instance, they don't have enough patients in a population. They put the university in a town of, uh, of uh, 30,000 people, in a county of, uh, of 55 or 60,000 people. So they've got to bring in a bigger population, and they could do some good sending their students out for the same self-serving reasons. Mr. Roth, one of the questions that went unanswered was why the small size of the uh, graduating classes. And yeah. I am interested in that because I know what the university says. They say there are not enough teachers. This is their A number one answer, right? This is well, all they can handle. I think they do that. I thought someone else might want to try their hand at it. Uh, is there another answer to that? I, I don't have a, you know, I've listened to the debates and I, I'm unclear. There's a debate inside of medicine as to whether the quality that we claim we have is based on the size of classes so that at the University of Rome and in, uh, in Paris and in other places where they're able, and Mexico I think city, they're able to have lecture classes of 750 and 800 and uh, our biggest med schools I suppose have classes of 200 on that order and the West Virginia's moved from 60, as far as I know, do you know any differently anyone from all the time? To 72 now in entering classes. I can give you one good illustration. Okay. My is a shortage of doctors in the state of West Virginia. <clears throat> I had a son that graduated from West Virginia in 1944. And the, he finished up in Richmond the last two years. He served two years in the Navy. Then he came back to located at Sutton. And the Four old doctors there, all of them past the age of retirement, and they just started him out. Mm -hmm. He couldn't make a living there. And they're still practicing in their eighties. He he went from Sutton to Grantsville and located down there with another doctor, and they started him out down there. Now West Virginia is Braxton County is a poor area, and about 
two-thirds of the people don't pay their doctor bill. Uh, he told me the last night he was there. He had three patients in the office, and none of them had any money. They paid him what they got. He said, I can't keep going like that. So he located the state of Ohio, and he's doing all right up there. But he tried to fight it and went to jail. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's true of Germany right there. The doctors had the city so tied up in their own little <laughs> conference that when a new doctor comes in, he really can't exist. Some are coming over to practice almost there about a year and they have to go to come become living. Because the doctors have all the patients and they can't seem to get in. I don't know how they do it. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure there was a problem. But maybe that we can pick out one or two that would be representative of problems that you're facing as community representatives of how can you make an impact and change the type system that we're seeing. Tomorrow morning then we will go into to strategies. How can you have an impact? So Mike, you want to go ahead and... Uh... We have to move this very fast, I think, if we're going to get on the MDs, which we ought to do. Uh, if we can leave the hospitals and the West WVU Med Center, teaching centers. We haven't discussed extended care facilities and nursing homes. Now, if most hospitals were non-profit in their ownership, what about these facilities? How are they owned? They're mostly uh, profit-making. Everybody agree or we got some disagreements? Nursing homes, what are most of those? We agree on that? Well, many of them are county. A what? Many of them are like county nursing homes. Now, what's the big, if the big majority of the other way is the opposite way here, they're proprietary. They're owned by some owner. How about the state? How about the state? Put into some nursing homes. The federal government gets so much money. Well, now, payments is another thing, but the ownership. There, is, there are owners who make money, just like you make money on a factory or make money on a, is where most of the nursing homes and extended care facilities in the United States are. And then a minority are non-profit. But this is the opposite of the hospital situation. This came up before Medicare. This was, oh, you know, 88, 90%. Now that means they're mostly small ownership, but increasingly, chains have moved in. Extended care is on the stock market. Like Kentucky Fried Chicken, a lot of it's over-the-counter uh, stocks, and uh, you can look them up and find them. Extended care has picked up 30 or 40 of these. Uh, Hospital Corporation of America owns uh, another 40 or 50. Uh, they, I forget, Beverly Enterprises out of California has bought a 10 or 12 of them in Pennsylvania. They've moved in and turned them into money-making enterprises. Now, extended care facilities get a lot, as Ms. Jones was just, uh, Ms. White was just saying, of Medicare dollars flow this way. Medicare dollars very heavily support extended care facilities. That's the, the highest caliber <coughs> of skilled nursing care outside a hospital after you get out of a hospital. You know, usually after so many days in the hospital, you know, you go into an extended care facility. I'd like to ask you a question at this point about the uh, nursing homes. Mm -hmm. Is it not a fact that as long as they're approved by the state that they can receive funds? Whose funds? Uh, Medicare. No, the, Medicare requires certification. Okay. To get uh, I, I believe, uh, someone correct me if they know this, but my, not, uh, my understanding is that an extended care facility must be certified by Medicare, by Social Security Administration, to get and Medicare. There are a few of them are. Yes. Yeah, and increasingly they're arguing over whether they're getting paid enough, so some of them want the money from the patient and don't want the Medicare, you know, it's become well, a nice well, the Medicare because it takes six months to receive payment. All right, that type of thing. Okay, uh, then uh, the uh, welfare guidelines then are less stringent, right? Right. So uh, let's uh, use, for example, one nursing home in Huntington receives uh, funds from welfare. My goodness. <laughs> 
they don't even have a decent restroom for these people. And they clean the patients up on the day that they're told that the inspector will be by for the parent or people are coming to see them. And now we the well, this is uh, supposedly licensed because it does uh, receive funds from welfare. Yeah, welfare also You're going down too into the uh, small homes where there's two or three into a home. Yeah, and they can cover this well. by not having too many to watch. And in that way, they do not have to be licensed. Well, you see, this moves down. Extended care, then you get a lower level, and then finally you get uh, custodial care or domiciliary care. It's really a residence away from some little place in the hollow that a guy would be living in otherwise. And that's getting down to where they'll even pay for that in some cases. Yes. But Medicare won't pay for that. Then maybe the Department of Welfare in your state will. Welfare will pick that up. Right. A lot of if time. we can, let's not get, as long as you understand ownership, there's no question this is a money making, essentially, money-making industry with a lot of new capital coming into it. The bed cost and so forth is up now at about ten to $15,000 per bed in initial construction. A lot of these extended carols don't even start out with the profit making by right. uh, the land being donated right. if it goes back to the people. Right. There's one we forgot I just want to bridge to before we go to the drug companies is home health services, which got their big impetus out of Medicare because they authorized a hundred of these visits a year, post-hospital visits, and then they authorized another hundred under your medical card, Part B of your Medicare, so a person could theoretically get 200 of these visits from, you know, a visiting nurse in the home. This is very important, and by the regulations, this is non-profit. Now, this is very important. By federal regulations, which means they could have had federal regulations doing that, but they didn't dare to do it. It was already a privately owned industry. But by regulations, there were very few visiting nurse services, and so they, by regulation, require they be nonprofit. So those are either affiliated with nonprofit hospitals, or a freestanding, or a church sponsored, they're something. Ours are state sponsored. Okay. The county health department of the state may back up. Now let's get to drugs. Drug companies. What kind of money are we dealing with here? Is this nonprofit? Any nonprofit here? Is there such a thing as a nonprofit drug company? <laughs> Not that I know of. Okay. Very good. Okay. So this, what kind of capital are we dealing with here? It's very big capital. A lot like research. Research on something may take 10, 20, 30 million dollars before it begins to pay off, even though it sells for six cents later, because they're going to sell so many billions of them, they're going to recover it over a period of years. And so things like tetracycline, which is the biggest antibiotic you get, all those myosin drugs and all, start out being 60 cents, you know, they try to hold the line and it starts down a little, but even selling them wholesale, at seven cents, these companies are making a fortune because they're going to be selling them for decades then, even though the initial investment might have been in tens of millions of dollars in research. Yeah, but I think the other important thing about drug companies, I have to think about drug companies, is of course the utilization of their money to promote the continued cost of the other services. You know, the image making of Dr. Welby is done by your drug company's money to the AMA. And it's the drug company money that goes okay. pours into WVU and the, to a large extent determines. All right, then let's talk about the drug company money a minute and then we'll turn over for the doctors. What what kinds of ways do they pour their money in? Want to talk about what are they in it? The image making. Huh? WVU gets its research money. Grants. A lot of grants. Okay. Anyone argue with that from WVU or elsewhere? What do they do with individual doctors? How do they corrupt them? Huh? Samples. Yeah, all right. Boxes. And that, let, let's call it, you know, uh, yeah. gifts Samples. in quotes. Well, if you gave, if you yeah. go in and give a person 200 or $1,200 worth of samples, 
uh, there isn't any word for this. When you give it to a policeman, it has a word. When you give it to anything, it's phony. It's phony as a $9 bill, but it's got a cover on it, see? Now, the doctor passes it on to you so you don't scream over your $7 or $9 I disagree with that. Uh, he bill. passes on to his friends, All right, he which passes are on usually to people who, who can pay for it. <laughs> okay. You're saying he passes it on to the people who... Who could afford it? He gives it to him as friends. Right. I, I wouldn't argue with that. Yeah. those who really need okay. it and couldn't afford it. All right. Okay. Uh, the point is, this is a corruption. All kinds of gifts. Unless you're in a doctor's office, you have no idea of what comes through there. You know, from goodies, from calendars for the children that cost uh, six and eight dollars, from toys, flowers from Florida. First aid covers, stamps, coins, you name it, Tommy. Books. Hobbies, yeah. books. Uh, every doctor in med school has the hand of these guys on. He gets his first black satchel from the drug company, gets his first stethoscope, gets everything. He never forgets it. Eli Lilly or whoever gives it to him, you know, their name, they hand it to him. The gifts are constant. We pay for that. What other corruption is there? Ads. Did you ever look at a medical journal? Or life magazine. Did you ever, no, but they they don't advertise to the public. The, the companies we're talking about don't advertise to us. I'm not talking about Eli Lilly and Merck deal with doctors. Pick up medical journals. Take 30 or 40 medical journals. And the color photography on heavy volume paper. And the 12 to 14 million dollars a year of net income to the AMA over the cost of printing the journal subsidizes the AMA's political activities and lobby and so forth, all of its stuff. is money fed in from drug companies at our expense. Pills it could be 20 cents or 60 cents. You see, Even so, the AMA newsletters. Uh, anything, because they, they don't tell them what to do with it. They pay very heavy fees for these ads and give them profits for their journals. Did you ever see their catalogs they put out Right. All kinds of publications, books, this gentleman said. You'd have to see the books that arrive in the mail. These books are very valuable. Like a medical library, you probably average is spending thirty to forty dollars each time you buy a book. All of a sudden a drug company gives away a book on you know, some valuable subject. Well, let's say they it, it certainly is worth twenty, twenty five dollars. You know, and these guys are coming around with this all the time. Any doctor can tell any detailed man who calls on him that he needs any quantity within reason of drugs, 2,000, 2,500 for a relative, and is given those drugs. This is a known fact. Uh, any doctor I know does this. You know, he's got a mother, an aunt, somebody, he's asking for a year's supply of some, you know, thing. They just get, they do this routinely. This is a media thing they do. That's to get them to do one thing. This is what they want in return. Brand name prescribing in place of what? In Okay. In other words, it's in your interest if the doctor writes the chemical name of the drug, provided that your pharmacist isn't a crook and turns it around and, and hands you back the high price thing. But if he will buy it, you need a system. You can't beat the system with one little piece of it. You know, you, you split the system open and then it, you know, shifts and you fall down. Uh, I think the uh, young lady that spoke said it's complicated. So when you win this, you lose it. You, you haven't won it because in Fairmont, we got a bunch of consumers to doing this. So they did it. What did the pharmacists in town do? The idea was to bring down tetracycline from 60 cents to 15, which is what we were selling it for in a nonprofit pharmacy trying to force it on the town. What did we find they did? They bought Army surplus at four cents and sold them at 15. They were already two years old and half of them had lost their potency. I mean, you know, there's no way to beat the system because you got the doctors beat by the consumer pressure so the pharmacists came in and stole it back from them, see? They sold it for 15, but they were selling them junk, you see? We were trying to get them to sell the high quality. Mr. Ross, there's the request.
he said, uh, I think it was four ounces for three dollars and something. And they had another size, one ounce for one dollar. So I go to this other drugstore and uh, I had the prescription filled. And he said he only, you know, had the small size of it. No, 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 wait a minute. He gave me uh, a small size and he told me it cost $50 and <laughs> some cents, you know. So I told him, I said, well, I just came from a drugstore that didn't have it, and you told me to pay this for the four ounces. And he looks something. <laughs> he really wanted to tell me to get out. But uh, nevertheless, he said, well, if they didn't have it, I guess they could quote your price on it. I said, well, I said, uh, if, <coughs> if it's a misunderstanding about it, I said, I guess I can have it filled someplace else tomorrow. I said, she had this problem, you know, for about a week, and I don't guess another day would hurt her. He said, well, I I'll fill it this time for this price, but I don't appreciate him telling you what price it was if she didn't have it. <laughs> Let's uh, move, if we can, to people who hold the MD degree. And there's no question we're now dealing with, with probably the as high status in our society, probably only exceeded maybe by Supreme Court justices or something in the general public image. Um, these men learn enough Latin so that they can uh, write a prescription that you can't understand, otherwise they're not Latin scholars. Their education is seriously deficient for the most part in the arts and the humanities, understanding of human nature, and a great deal is being devoted to trying to improve it, to try to turn them into human beings. Now this lady started out some time ago by trying to focus on this issue. First of all, what's their general background? In other words, in order to get to med school, who are most of them likely to be? All right. So one big group are doctors' sons. Wow. What other kinds of people's sons <coughs> heavily make it into? I mean, what? Okay. The generally upper echelon groups. And uh, is this a figment of our imagination or are there studies on the class, social class background of medical students? Do you think there are studies that prove this? There are extensive studies that prove the upper echelon character of, uh, uh, does this mean a working class kid doesn't get through? No, doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that a coal miner's kid doesn't get through occasionally. In Grand Town, uh, one coal miner has uh, two doctor sons. Uh, and all of you know the exceptions, you know, that some ordinary uh, black citizen's son makes it through or others, right? But uh, in general, you have very serious problems. Let me give you just one, uh, the simplest one. Italian-Americans, even worse than blacks because right now there's special programs to get blacks in. Throughout the United States, Italian-American neighborhoods have traditionally been without Italian-American doctors. They are very rare for their numbers and for what Italian-Americans represent in the United States. And again, because most Italian-Americans are blue-collar, you know, and in the groups that are uh, ignored. Now, so they tend to be upper social class. That's just a fact. Study after study shows it. As another thing happens to them in medical school, anybody got any idea what happens to them philosophically, what happens to them as people in medical school? Any guessing? Well, Come on. What? Well, well, yeah. Some brainwashing? Yeah. Does anyone want to put it in any sharper terms of what they think happens? Deification. All right. A deification. Different words. Anyone? Yeah. Try it. Go ahead. Um, I would say because of the way the medical education system is set up now, they're taught to care about cases and not people because of the, the training system. And only now is the emphasis beginning to shift back 
the communication with the patient and caring for the patient rather than the disease. And I think this is probably one of the reasons that the West Virginia and a lot of other places have turned inward. Let, let's, the, the, the essential point, let me just follow that for a second, and then, then you get in. You said, you know, AMA begins its work, somebody said brainwashing, DFA, all kinds of that. There's a number of things I just want to throw out for you to think about picking up from that. First of all, medical education is only now beginning to understand how disease-oriented it is. If you back off a minute, it's really a sick, sick business, you see, of turning an ordinary young person into a doctor. And the, the medical educators are deeply disturbed as they look at themselves in a mirror, as they've been doing in their own Journal of Medical Education and other places. For instance, the beginning point of first-year education is a dead body. This is the most important focus that they must focus on, right? Now, now whatever you want to say in scientific terms, and I want to try to be as, as generous and as uh, accepting as possible in, in an area where I'm very weak and, and not understanding of the, of the scientific nature. The fact that you must learn anatomy by carving up a dead human being in great detail is such a ghoulish spectacle that it's rather obvious of what it signifies symbolically if you're not doing some things as was just indicated in the critique to make them people oriented. In other words, unless you're doing a lot to make them people oriented, you are concentrating on death, you're concentrating on disease. Now increasingly in medical school there are two other things happening. One is that, and, and here again it's a specialty field in which I have no training, never took a course in it, but I've, I've read a great deal. The psychology experts who write in this field say that medical students in the first year, in the first months as freshmen, are very high in idealism. They have entered medicine for idealistic reasons as these guys measure it, to help humanity, to help their, you know, to all the, whatever the, you know, phrases, and they string them out to show what they mean. The same people, same students tested by psychologists in the fourth year, and I'm not now talking about the last, these are studies that precede the activist you know, movement that has entered all of the uh, universities, so I'm leaving that out, you know, which may have made some of them revolutionary, you know, or idealist for different reasons, all political. But this was studies, you know, like in the uh, 50s and 60s of, you know, of uh, repeated studies. They were the most dollar-oriented and more than, more so than business administration candidates graduating or those in similar fields, accounting, etc., follow me in the graduate programs. They had moved. And the only explanations they offer in this is the pecking order in medicine. In other words, they're in a university medical center and they're looking at this full-time faculty, you know, and listening to the rumors. That guy works for 18,000, I mean now current dollars, you know, 23,000. And then in comes the attending, right? He parks his Cadillac with four gold wheels out in the parking lot and looking out the window. They notice the deference and the respect with which that attending doctor is treated compared to the, you know, full-time faculty member who is very low in the totem pole. We don't respect full-time faculty, you know, in our society and in med schools least of all with amongst doctors. And they, they base it on that. That's one thing happening to them. The second thing that's happening to them is they're moving from a great many thinking of being family doctors to a great many by the fourth year being convinced they're going to be sub, sub specialists. Now, I don't want to use words that lose anybody. They have moved away from helping, wanting to serve families and people and being pediatricians, 
uh, GPs, adult medicine doctors, and have decided they want to be hematologists and endocrinologists and endless streams of people who take care of one inch of you or one system of you. ENT, ear, nose, throat. That's pretty big, one inch, two inch, three inch. That's a very broad specialty, see? And real questions as to how many we need in the United States and any of these things. In England, they have one-fifth for their population. For every 10,000 people, they have one-fifth the number of surgeons we have in this country. As far as we know, they do very adequate surgery. They're not overworked. There's a very serious question as to whether if you generate enough surgeons, they're not going to generate enough cutting. And, and this is what these latest studies are very scary about. We never knew this before, but somebody suddenly decided to study specialties and subspecialties and decide, well, this is ridiculous. English medicine and ours are almost alike, you know, aside from the way they're organized and the way they treat people and diagnose. What are we doing with five times as many, you know, surgeons for a, every 10,000 people as they do? Do you, do you think the social class background The trend from idealism towards dollars, if it's true, the trend towards subspecialists, don't have to get up much at night to bother with you, right? Just an eye doctor, just a very small part of it, huh? Have something to do with the outlook? Then there's one more thing I'm throwing out, and then you all are throwing in your things. Someone has said that the character of doctors is very important. And that one of the worst ways in which MDs are denied character is this pecking order of the status that they finally reach by starting at the bottom and moving up, and in which they finally are surrounded by scared patients in a horizontal and naked condition, by hero-worshipping nurses and sycophantic interns by which they mean everyone around them thinks they're God. That's the, they finally reached the top of the pyramid. They finished, you know, their training. Now, what does that do to character, is what some people might say. You know, it's very important, they tell me, uh, since President uh, Nixon has gone to China, it's become uh, possible to speak of acupuncture and so forth. Uh, it, it's uh, very important, they tell me, that. Uh, under uh, the Chinese system, people like myself uh, are given a broom at least a half a day each week just to remember, you know, uh, you know, if you're in a sedentary occupation, their idea is, uh, you know, you go out and you farm or you at least uh, sweep the place, you know, as a cleaning person for a half a day a week. It means that, does anyone ever tell a doctor, talk back to a doctor? Because that is one of the great building of character. If, I mean, if you've got an institution in which somebody can talk back to you, it builds your character. But does anyone ever really talk back to a doctor? Do you? Or don't they just walk with their feet? Don't they vote with their feet? You quit it. Not you, like you, you talk back? I have. Okay. Okay. I was, huh? ordered, I was told I would not be serviced if I came back to them, but I came back to the man in service and got okay. I would, I would say both of you have extremely unusual character. And, and, well, I'd probably, if you come to this workshop, I'm flattered enough to think that everybody here is on extremely high character. My point is this, and think about it. Most people deal with doctors by voting with their feet. You quietly decide in SOB and you switch doctors. For instance, the and leading ophthalmologist in Morgantown. He's a very good ophthalmologist. He's an eye specialist. The girl out in front of his office is the most offensive human being that ever lived. Everybody knows it, and everybody has known it for the last 15 years. She has trained each and every one of the other seven girls as well as she can to be the most offensive and vicious human beings that ever existed. He is a nice guy when you get in to see him. He's well trained. He knows what he's doing. 
They open the mail. She opens the morning mail in front of 22 to 30 people and reads aloud and laughs at patient letters. She reads aloud and does other vicious things, count cards, and the whole dialogue is her on stage, see? He's absolutely blind to this. And I've watched his patient load. I was once asked to be a consultant, you know, reviewing it and so forth. It's the one place I finally made up my mind what I'd suspected. They either subject themselves to him, but nobody has ever told the king he is naked. You see what I mean? Nobody walks in and says, do you know that you have the worst SOB who ever lived out there, you know, and you think she's the greatest thing that ever walked, you know, and he hasn't even told that. Now, is that good for him or for me or for you? If I, if, sometimes we start down a road that's wrong, and if somebody doesn't call us up short or correct us, you know, it gets worse, right? And I'm, I'm simply saying I think a lot of this, of what happens to doctors, it's their own fault. Well, they get to the top and nobody ever tells them they're wrong too much. Well, they don't bump into people. People are scared to say there's another human being and they can just open to the door. Well, what do you mean by that? Consumers have been knocked out for much too. Well, they say to people, you know, they have been accepted in the walk off instead of standing up and telling them how they feel. You can go to a doctor's office now and tell them that you have a toothache and you'll write the prescription and you'll take them and sit down and ask them, well, what is the wrong with, with me? What did you find the wrong with me? A doctor don't give me the script when I tell him what's wrong because I'm not going to take him. I'm going to take him. You know, I have learned this through joint organizations like I am now. This is the way I learned. That I was taking the script for walking out. I don't know what I was taking. I didn't even know what was wrong with me. I was hurt and I went to him. He wrote the script and I left. And when I started to ask him, you know, now he knows the show before I leave. Do you think most people are like you were, though, before you joined a, a health care organization? Still, I have to overcome. And partly, though, I think the psychology of at least some people is that they want the reassurance and not know what wrong is, what's wrong as much as they want relief from the symptom. They don't even care what's causing it. They, all they want is relief from that symptom. They're symptom-oriented. Yes, and here you go back to the drugs again. That's You'll right. find that a lot of them will be giving you sugar pills. You go to a certain uh, pharmacy and end up giving a, you the uh, sugar pill, but you're paying for something else. But that goes to your education again, where we're educated to be symptom conscious. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of educational mechanisms that are educated to be symptom conscious. And then we don't question, you see, what's done to relieve the symptoms. Well, we have went out into the areas and say, I reach work. is not only a science, it's an art, okay? It, it's, uh, there's no question in my mind that if other societies have witch doctors, you know, and other means of this, that sometimes we are wanting to just, you know, we want a leader, we want someone to put a, for instance, being touched is very important sometimes, you know? Uh, it, the laying on of hands, like a doctor that, uh, uh, deals with you in, in, in two minutes if another guy just uh, examines you. You know, the like person feels better and feels more thorough about it. 
as some of the examination may be absolutely meaningless. Some doctors psychologically seem to understand more what the, you know, this laying on is. The doctor really often doesn't know what's wrong, and don't forget what Osler said, that most of us are going to get well anyway, especially in children, you see. I mean, very often we credit the doctor with having done something when on the third day the child was going to get well no matter what he tried to do to him. Well, he did, unless he pulled a boner and killed the kid, <laughs> you know, unless he got in the way and delayed it, the kid was going to get well. Yet I've often heard, you know, some people swear by our pediatricians. You know, they come in on two and a half day of something that is going to go away on the third day. Boy, I tell you, your pediatrician is the best ever. Uh, great, you know, but, uh, you know, in your mind you've got to know a lot of that is that way. And yet you curse the same person when it doesn't seem to have nothing happens for two or three days. Well, then they'll say, it isn't better two or three days, call me here. Okay. Uh, Very good. Some of you are ready to be doctors. You don't really. Psychiatrists, too. <laughs> Let me get to money now. That's the filthy lucre again. What kind of money do doctors make? What, what, what range? Where are they? I know a doctor who's making $100,000 a year. All right. You know of one making 100 thousand, huh? Use them for a thousand, okay? There was recently a story in, in the Chicago newspaper about one doctor in Illinois who made $250,000 off of Medicare and Medicaid patients only. Okay. Now, there was a story that one doctor made it off of Medicare and Medicaid, 250, that's one doctor, okay? But that, these are big deals. Well, what do you think doctors make relative to other people? I think that I recall reading uh, some sort of study yeah. of doctor's salary, and it seems that the average is somewhere is around $35,000 a year. All right, now, let me, let, we're getting some things now. Anyone want to keep it going? Let's get a lot in front of us, and then we'll dissect this, In too. other words, uh, they make in five years what they expected in terms of... Uh, the average educated person is... Uh, you, you're referring to this figure now? Yes, uh -huh. Well, educated people probably well, make more in, than... Uh, oh, in five, I'm trying to divide it and see if you're saying they're making five times what... Uh, you know, you got to remember no, now no, that... Uh, of course, next yeah. let, Let's, enough, let's keep some things in mind. Okay. Uh, right. Is There's no question in your mind there are men in the building trades now, iron workers and others, that make eighteen and twenty thousand. Right? Is there any question anymore that certain men in very high and dangerous trades? Is there any question that coal miners? Yeah, they work full time, a lot of them too. That what? Uh, no, I'm saying if they work full time, if they there's ifs in here, but there are some that are in covered jobs and they can make this. Okay, and they're men. There's no question in your mind any longer that coal miners work regular work weeks, not two and three days a week, and that they're able, many of them, to make ten to twelve thousand. There are some who make less, and there are some who make fourteen thousand. Okay? But Is there any argue with me? It's right. I'm trying to get it relevant. Well, I think uh, uh, this is more or less the, the norm. You see. In other words, where it takes the average person yeah. to make yeah. about a lifetime, they can make. Five years. All right. There are a lot of factory workers that think they're doing pretty good if they're making 160 a week, though. Huh? That fair too? Four bucks an hour? That's a goal in life on a 40 hour week. Huh? The doctors charge okay. them just as much as they do yeah. for 20 bucks. Now, were you satisfied that one person thought a doctor, she knew of a doctor, make 100000 one making 250000 for Medicare, an average of 35000 because I now want to take it up another way, the dollars, okay? You got you, that? Yeah. Before you go any further, let me say this. About three years ago, I was invited to a county medical society meeting. I won't say where. During the course of the evening, after cocktails and so on, they forgot that I was there. That's a very serious mistake. Very serious. One one physician said to the to the group there. He says, "Gentlemen, he says, I think that this is a, is an important occasion." He says, "I believe as I look around that every one of us can say that we are now making a hundred thousand a year." He says, "We can now press on to the two hundred thousand dollar mark." You are saying this may be uh, higher than average. In the area you were, you're not saying where that was or who was threatened. All right. 
and, and we may have meant gross, okay? This was gross from Medicare, Medicaid. You understand the difference between gross and net? He's got a big overhead in there. Guy netting this kind of money may have to do it with a whole string of nurses and, you know, laboratory, have a lot of overhead. We don't know. Uh, this was a net. I think you intended this as net, okay? You may have intended that one as net. <coughs> have you got those in your mind for a minute? Because I want to approach it a little different. If I ask you what kind of doctors you know, I'm not meaning Kentucky or Ohio or West Virginia, but by specialty, what do you think, what kind of doctors, and, and some of the professionals and organizers, be quiet a few minutes and just let the ordinary people guess around here a few minutes, okay? What kind of doctors, by specialty, do you think make the most money? What kind of doctors do you think make the most money? within doctors. Come on, some of you, that try it out for size. What kind of doctor do you think makes the most? Surgery. Huh? Surgery. Surgery. Right. You want to do some guessing, Miss? You got any idea, Miss White? Are you to the bottom or the top that you think? Where do, would you put the GP? Yeah. Here? Or? Huh? A lot of money you put. Okay. Okay. All right. What? Anyone? What? Someone want to express a... Well, I could put the general practitioner at the bottom. You'd put the GP here. Okay. Yes. All right. Who else would you put here? Anyone want to nominate? Heart specialist. Who else? Anyone want to nominate? A heart specialist. Heart specialist. All right, any words you want to use, anything you want to say. I'm just You're talking about right. people that are not in medical care or not in any organized Ear, nose, and throat. University. Ear, nose, and throat. Who else makes little money, do you think? Skin specialist. Huh? Skin, skin down here or up there? Down. Down, skin. Okay. <laughs> okay. He's a skinny specialist. <laughs> All right. Now, now let's... Talk. This is your guessing, okay? Let's, let's play. Now let me give you some of the real way that... Are you talking about strict medical yeah, or well, uh, how about psychiatry? Yeah, all right. Where would you put psychiatry? I would at the top. At the top. Where? Psychiatry. Okay. All right, now let's stop it for a minute. And let me give you some, some uh, measurements uh, that we can uh, either measure in West Virginia or we have nationally. Okay? The people that make the most money are not visible to you. That's the first thing. The people that make the most money you don't put on your list because they're not visible. Now, what do I mean by that? They're not, you don't meet them. They're doctors' doctors. If you ever meet them, they got red goggles on, you think they're a technician. For instance, a radiologist. What does he ever do? He reads an x-ray film. If you ever meet him, uh, he's probably got red goggles on while you're getting a GI series. Making a lot of money. In West Virginia, I know of none making under 100000 In Huntington, they have a locked up monopoly that probably nets each of them over 250000 in, uh, in uh, Clarksburg, one of them was reported for income tax purposes to have netted over 900000 Radiology is not someone you meet. These are x-ray doctors. They cannot be bought for $50,000. In other words, you, you go to, you get a, a Cuban refugee, you go anywhere to try to find one that can't speak English. You know, you'll have an interpreter to handle his dictation or something. It won't help you. you uh, you're dealing with, you know, uh, he'll quit you as soon as he, you start him out because the next month someone will double him. Uh, what else is up there? That's, these are hospital-based people. Anesthesiologists make money. Mm -hmm. Pathologists. Why don't you meet a pathologist? Because he looks in microscopes. Does he look in the microscope on the lab test? No, he gets a cut on everything that the lab technician does. You know, talk about a sharecropping system, it couldn't be beat. Oh, that's why the lab technician doesn't make money. Ah, you begin. You're beginning to catch on. Okay. Now, who, let me check that. Do these guys always make a lot of money? No. 
They deal with heart disease. But these are internal medicine specialists. And an honest internist is hard put to make 40,000. An honest internist who isn't running a mill, you know, isn't running a big lab and a big x-ray, just grinding out a lot of stuff. The guy who's taking an hour with you on physicals, you know, and taking care of adult medicine, the guy who's with you in the coronary care unit, uh, they don't make big dough, you follow me? Sometimes they manage to get up to 40 or to 50, you know, but they're not in the big dough. You're right about ear, nose, and throat, orthopedics, which is bone, big money. Your ophthalmologists sometimes are in the eyeglass business, which your eye doctors, many of them dispense the glasses and make more money as businessmen dispensing the glasses. In Morgantown, there's no question about it, the man makes more money dispensing glasses then, huh? Or the obedience. The obstetricians are somewhere in the middle. Some general surgeons, some general surgeons are in the top, somewhere in the middle. They're very scattered. Okay? Now, I want to jump it another way. What about the whole, if this is doctors, we're trying to give you a fast background for your decision making tomorrow in your discussion. Psychiatrists, I don't class high. Pediatricians, I put down here. Pediatricians don't make, why? If a pediatrician charges you more than seven dollars and you come in with three children, you know, she almost discounts. Do you ever notice her? He does it. You know, they'll throw one in for nothing or, you know, uh, you, you, you really don't believe you should be charged that much. You resent it. Uh, so it's hard for a pediatrician to sock it to you hard. Psychiatrists who deal with Marilyn Monroe might make a lot of money, but most of them are, they're not kooks, but they, uh, they, they'll they do without a lot of money. They're, they're, uh, they're oddballs in our society, many of them. A few of them are out to make Your money. Your analysts make money. Yeah, there are some analysts who make money, but psychiatrists are not in the big money-making crowd that make real big money, unless they're in a special setting, special setting, where they make making, got a lot of it. Now, let me talk about one more thing. This is the American Pyramid of Income, huh? That's the American Pyramid of Income, isn't it? Uh, let's say the, the people who make the upper, uh, 10% of income in the steel industry. Okay, call us the steel industry. Now we'll compare it to the health industry. And then there'll be a large group, you know, another 30% make this kind of money, you know, craftsmen and foremen. Then there'll be the skilled and semi-skilled, and then there'll be a mass, right? Most of the people be at least 60, 70% in here, right? Healthcare is not quite this bad, see, right? But it's very bad, and it's only recently getting corrected. Because your MDs, some 300,000 of them, make a big chunk of money. And then there's a huge gap. This isn't fair. I'll give you a fair graph. If that's a graph, you can't graph the health industry, you know? What you got to do in the healthcare industry is something like this. An ordinary industry goes like this. There are very few making a dollar sixty, common labor and steel, right? Very few making, say, over twenty-five thousand in steel, right? And a lot of people making in here in the steel industry. The healthcare industry is wild, isn't it? It comes in numbers, right? It goes something like this and out. And all we're making over 30,000 are a lot of people. The graph goes up. But the people who really ought to be a lot of dietary, a lot of very housekeeping, <coughs> labor people, right, all over the hospitals are below the minimum wage, dragging on the minimum wage, dragged into the minimum wage, big numbers. Then your RNs have only recently come into this movement, you know. We, what do you mean? The virtue of American capitalism has been this big middle bulge, right? That's what's kept the system. In other words, if Marx's predictions had been explicitly true, you would have had a revolution by now. But for reasons of social, you know, uh, social legislation, 
because of the trade union movement, because of the social critics. We have this huge bulge which keeps the system moving. The crisis in health care is this bottoming out, you see. You've got this horrible tens of thousands in each state at the minimum wage and below, and you have this huge number of doctors up here. Where's the middle management? The virtue of American industry. You know, it's middle management, middle income, right? All these levels. The foreman, by, in other words, the nurses ought to be people making 14, 15,000. The physician's assistants, you know, 16, 18, 20. And we're just beginning to invent the titles, nurse practitioner, all these things. Okay, I'm trying to do it very fast. The chairman's been signaling me for five or ten minutes. You all got a busy day tomorrow. I don't want to keep you up late, but has anyone, as the Quaker said, got something so important that they want to break the silence? <laughs> Come on, anyone want to hit it while they're hot? I think about nurses' wages. They're entitled to everything they get, but if you have to have a private duty nurse, the ordinary income can't afford it. I do. That's why a National Health Service program may be the only answer. I have a question, <laughs> an observation. That if this is true, this uh, this bottom line here, uh, the physician, uh, this this large uh, medical cost over here is in addition to hospitalization where all of these other people are located. Yeah. Why the... Uh, Lady. I'm describing the health care industry I, I as an industry, all its components. I realize this. Even take his office. I am amazed every time I go in as a consultant, you know, and a physician thinks I can help him in a management sense just because, you know, you know something general about it. To find the guy unashamedly has some of the cleverest girls I've ever met in my life working for two bucks an hour, you know. He unashamedly has them doing that. You know, they got the brain power to, you know, they're holding this whole operation together. The goddamn fool couldn't move without it, you know? And uh, their loyalty to this magic, you see, pertains all over the place. There's and the work. guy's walking away with maybe $130,000 a year next, you know? That's worship. Yeah. Huh? That's worship. It's a lot of things. But it is wild. It exists in their own offices. You look in physicians' offices. They are not good places for pay. And if, if some of you want to argue with me, I wish you would. But uh, generally, the whole industry is rotten, except for the people at the top up here, the MDs. Uh, at the inception of the um, uh, Anapology program that uh, started as the Capital County Community Action, they had the wages set above the policy level, which then was $3,000 a year. So uh, when uh, some of the uh, different agencies and business people around the area heard that uh, these people were making over 3000 uh, these office people were making over $3,000 a year, they said, just think what they're doing with the taxpayers' money. I don't pay mine a penny more than $200 a month. And someone in the agency said, well, you've got a lot of damn fools working for you. <laughs> I said, well, I never said that. I ran the property program. They've got to pay their office help more. Yeah, I, think I, know, the same curve. I know one area that had, uh, had to cut it because the grant would not do it because they had it over. And they had to bring it down to the regular okay. minimum wage. Well, one of the things that, you know, we constantly hear about law and order in this country recently is about how so much crime is committed by poor people and by black people, etc. Seems from what you said today that a lot of the crimes that are committed in this country are not in the statistics. And I've warned you of my biases in this field. I've tried to say. I have my own feelings, my own pressure, and I laid them on the table with you. But you have to draw your own conclusions, and I don't try to draw your action conclusions. You know, I'm trying to be helpful in, in a way to stimulate your thinking. You know, that was the job I was supposed to do, of setting enough facts about the industry, about the program, about the establishment in front of you. I'm sorry I did it, you know, maybe hurriedly, and I tried to follow your own lead at times in your interest. Uh, this is a very important point we're on here now, and could well deserve a great deal of discussion, you know, on itself. The fact that this kind of curve exists in the healthcare industry 
is a sign of sickness and crisis in itself, aside from anything else, you know. There should not be an industry without the great American virtue of a huge, middle, loyal, you know, bunch at coal houses. You name it. You know, coal miners would curve out this way, too. Very few low-paid coal miners. You know, in scab mines, you know, or very, you know, at a few surface jobs, etc. Most of them in the middle. And so you tend to have a certain basic loyalty, you know, to the industry. What you've got here is a built-in crisis, you know, that one of the days that the, the nation has to solve. This is not right. In fact, this curve is wrong because, as you know, it ought to shoot way up to 300,000 of these guys. It's a very big shoot up here. In other words, this is terribly high, and it's a deep, deep chasm in the middle, and it's terrible. You know, a poor pay for just an awful lot of people, starting from here, way over to here, because this goes way up a bit rough here. But I hope you all draw your own conclusions, be warned against my own biases, and uh, I hope we can share together and, you know, come up with different answers, and nobody's going to have the same ones for this, but uh, I respect you all in your own ways as to what you want to do about these things, but I tried to furnish you some thinking material uh, about the healthcare industry. And I think, let me close in one note, because this can be very negative. If it were not for the dedicated physicians who will stay with the progressive programs that consumers lay out, nothing you're going to discuss tomorrow will be meaningful. In other words, don't ever get anti-doctor to the point you don't understand that it is the alliances and the adoption of a program which will hold the loyalty of scientifically trained doctors who are willing to renounce the old system and go towards some better system that without them, don't imagine you're going to do it with AIDS, with physician assistance, you know, or anything. It's going to take numbers of dedicated doctors who can accept a decent, humane program. This is not, I'm not anti-doctor, you follow me? I've been called the biggest doctor hater in the world, you know, by AMA types and all, but uh, uh, this kind of presentation has to be done. It's like, you know, you want to curse a surgeon for diagnosing, you know, we're diagnosing the system. But the love you better carry with you for doctors that are willing to break with the predominant system and share with consumers. Better be a strong one and you better adopt in any policies, you know, ones that can attract those people. Because it's absolutely essential. You cannot build a health care program without doctors, so don't try to do it, you know. There are some dreamers attempting it. I think this is outside the scope of possibility. And that means being reasonable and being rational as we approach this kind of problem and how to solve it. It's an awful tough one. It's full of grays. And I may have seemed agitational or something here as I presented it, but I hope uh, you'll forgive me for my prejudices. I've tried to lay them in front of you, and I thank all of you for the wonderful way in which you've uh, <coughs> contributed and responded here the whole evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kinsley gave us some characteristics of what he, what I, I would prefer to call the healthcare system. Uh, we were talking, uh, he was talking about systems as the EMD program and some of the trends that are going on within the MD program itself. He was talking about the idealism of the first year uh, med student that changes so that at the end of his tenure uh, in an educational institution of becoming dollar-oriented, more specific, income-oriented. Uh, he's talking also about the change from GPs to spaceless over the same period of time. Uh, one of the other things that, that I think all of these things fit into is the MD educational system itself and some of the problems that go on there. Uh, Another thing, another facet is the consumer respect of MDs. That is, uh, where does the consumer place the MD in terms of social status? And the point made by Mike is that way up someplace near the top, if not the top, is the MD. Uh, another point covered was the business of income uh, from MDs, uh, the basic point I think being made that, that MD incomes are much above average per capita income. 
Another point made was, and I would have liked to see this emphasized a little bit more, was the students' uh, entrance to med school. Uh, who are the people that are able to enter med school? Basically, they are uh, relatives of MDs or other professional people. Uh, the second uh, thing that uh, Mike dealt with was the establishment, uh, who calls the shop type organization thing, uh, really in terms of health care, where is the power located, who makes the decisions, uh, who are the policy makers, and who in essence dictate the programs of health care. Uh, Within that establishment thing, we talked about health insurance. We talked about uh, the housing dollar being primarily spent in hospitals, extended care, and drug companies. I think the basic point within all of this who calls the shot <coughs> category is the, the absence of consumers. In essence, uh, the consumer has little, if anything at all, to say about the health programs, the health policies, and the whole realm of, of aspects there. Another point uh, Mike made was the realities of care. Uh, he gave the example of, of Dr. Welby uh, and kind of the false sense of security that, that really is created. It comes over to the consumer, I think, uh, to the extent that what the consumer sees on television is what he expects to receive when he goes into a doctor's office. I'm also state prisoner of welfare rights. And I have a lot of different views about what Mike said. I had to write them down because I'm not very good at remembering too many things in my head. What I heard last night, I learned that the medical society is very crooked and only the rich survive. This is the impression that I got through Mike's you know, version. This is something that should not be. Health care is for every human being of all races. For example, when you go into the service, do the government need to tell you you're not able to serve your country because you're poor? This is a good example. Therefore, you should receive good health, health care, whether you're poor, rich, or middle class, whatever you are. I feel as though in order to stop this money-hungry power, we will have to fulfill that gap between consumers and providers and link as a whole together. We stand divided, we fall. Doctors know there is a divide line. I feel as though steps should be taken so we can stand together. Things I feel should happen. Hospitals receiving federal funds, we should make sure they are investigated more regular and come up with facts, how they are not serving the public. It's not up to the, pub, the people to investigate hospitals and keep them honest, but this we'll have to take upon ourselves because they are being run crooked. Our top priority should be a national health system. To get this, there needs to be an overall effort to bankrupt the present system, push it to its limits, hostels, and show its corruptions and inequalities to get the public so stirred up and disgusted that they will force a change in this system. I also agree that Mike talked on MDs and their fault. I feel that this does not remove the fear of people Telling people about the society, the doctors, and the way they're doing, it's easy for them to sit and listen, but it doesn't remove the fear when they're sick to go to fight against these doctors It's saying, you know, like, I have a pain. You tell me the doctors are in the system of making money, but I will not help you fight against this because I feel as though I will lose the service of this doctor, and this is a bad thing. And if the middle class group will work with the low consumer group, I feel as though we could beat the system. There is a gap. Welfare recipients have a medical card. Well, a working man goes into the doctor's office. He has a great big long bill. They're going for services to come out owing maybe $25, $30, or $40 for one call. Well, it makes him feel hurt because he feels as though this recipient goes in and flashes his card and, good, and gets good service. But he doesn't realize how hard it is for this recipient to get this doctor to see him at all. And if the both low income and middle class get together, 
and combine their thoughts and fight that as a whole, I do believe that we could tear and corrupt the tear system which the doctors have in these nonprofit hospitals and these nursing homes. But we'll have to fight together instead of saying the poor is getting advantage of the health care and we're not and we're working and we're paying taxes. I feel as though low income people pay taxes too. And this is the way we've been branded. The government has it this way that you look at the poor as getting everything in the United States and you're working for them. Though they receive a check, but they have to pay taxes. You can get a loaf of bread, cost you 40 cents with one penny tax. We have to pay taxes out of the check which we receive. And then he also said that the Italians, he feels as though we're the underdogs. Well, I don't believe in this fully. I believe that the whole nation is, is in a struggle for better health. Not only Italians is getting grants to going to college. Right now, you can take blacks, some Jews, Greeks, wherever you want to. They have a hard time getting into college and getting the degrees just as well as Italian. So we have to stop looking at nationalities and colors and start to fight as one as a whole in order to beat the struggle. As long as we keep it divided like we have it now, we'll never get anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Mike, you have heard Jim Collins debate at one they heard you say last night, turning in that you'd like to uh, react to it. Uh, I think the most important thing is what, what always happens uh, is that my own uh, experiences and, uh, is different than each of theirs and each of yours is different than theirs and each of us here's and reacts on the basis of what his life experience is. Uh, I'd like to, some of this I can do real fast. Uh, I, I hope uh, it's clear that I don't take all in these. I, I, I may believe a love of the, uh, of the humanitarian ones and of those who uh, uh, are growing the uh, understanding and willing to leave that fee system you know, a significant percentage of doctors are willing to accept salaries the way engineers, architects, attorneys, accountants, all kinds of well-trained people are in the whole setting. So, um, and I think once uh, they do, and are willing to work with consumers in some fashion, and you've got <coughs> professionals with whom you can growingly have a new relationship. So, uh, it's easy to agree without my uh, raise my right hand and keep it in. I don't give it up. Uh, health services available to all, I agree. Uh, I think mean, that, that should be the goal. One of the problems we have today is this isolation of the low income of the poor. And that's why he's focusing on this, Mr. Burke, is in terms of this separation is important. We not get it. Uh, we have to sometimes separate for a discussion, which I'll deal with in the last point that Ms. White made. I, I think we sometimes don't get separate in the room, we don't get separate in our lives, but we have to say certain things. In other words, if, we, if I was to sit here as a white person and be sitting with another group of whites and not refer to the lack of black dog, a doctor's relationship to the black population in this country, then it's terribly wrong. That is not separating people. That's just pointing out that, that 20 million Americans do not have their fair 10% of the share of doctors in this country. This is how rotten the system is, that there's very few black doctors. Now, that isn't separating out any more than I did, you know, on the uh, category. We, we better understand this as whites or as non, you know, <coughs> members of particular groups. There is a disparity there that has to be referred to. Something has to be done about it, or you won't understand why the medical schools are seeking out qualified black applicants. We've got to do something about that. The black community just lacks black doctors. And you can say, well, uh, you know, what's that got to do? Go to any doctor, but uh, it's pretty unfair when a tiny percentage of all the doctors are you know, black. But we're talking about services available to everybody, and it should not. Remember the example I gave, if you're the richest person in this country, I believe in that system, you know, that anyone had, they wouldn't ask you who you were, if you were, you know, <coughs> a Rockefeller, or if you were John White, president of WORO, 
it would not matter. They do that appendix on you and you see so you come back and you can say, well, why would they do it for nothing on him? Why don't they bill him and get back their 3000 Well, uh, unfortunately, this is the way, uh, unless you're really a revolutionary, you know, uh, which most people are not, this is the simplest way to do the thing. He gets Social Security when he's 65, and Joan White's going to get it when she's 65, you know, and, uh, and that's the way they handle health care. It's the simplest, univer we call it a universal system. You don't ask the person about their income. You just run to the service. You know, public schools are this way. They don't ask you your, they may have to ask you a few questions, age and so forth, but they don't go into anything to determine whether you get free education. And someone said, uh, Ms. White, I think, made some of the best points. Only the rich survive in health care. Uh, maybe that's a conclusion Ms. White would draw you know, based on representing a group of low-income people. I think I was trying to also say that the rich don't do so well either, you know, if they live in Doddridge County, if they, you know, we're pointing out that uh, there's a universal here. If you live in the wrong place, there are some very wealthy people in West Virginia that cannot get a doctor. On top of that, the, they get the horrible standards of care. Sometimes the society surgeon they go to because they're in a country club with them, is notorious in medical circles for being a, a you know, a, a, a what we call a whittler. Um, for instance, say he's a GYN surgeon. He whittles. I mean, everybody in the uh, in the uh, surgical field know this about him. He uh, he long ago made up his mind that a woman's organs are good for about twenty-two to twenty-five hundred dollars. So he works on the left ovary and he works on the right ovary. Now, I'm not saying this sometimes is necessary. Having worked on each of those, he now goes back and does a complete. And then he goes back and does a partial hysterectomy and then he does a full hysterectomy, you see. And what he's decided is I'm not going to go just one time go in, even though it appears necessary now, you see, to do the hysterectomy. Because then I'll be, you know, that it's gone. Now I can't whittle it for good. I'll take him one 375 clip and it's done. And this is his approach to surgery. And many society surgeons are this way, and the rich just eat them up. They love them. I mean, they drink cocktails with them. And so their care stinks too and needs a little supervision. In this country, I would say there's a class less issue almost on quality, on availability, except that from the point of view of the poor, there's still a thrust. If Ms. White heard me say it, that's right. The poor get the worst shape of all because they can't get in it. Can't get accepted. You can't get, you know, available. So I certainly endorse what she said about standing together and being united. And then I completely agree that we should talk about Hilbert funds, uh, federal congressional money on the Hilbert, flowing into hospitals, nursing homes, and else, where since 1946 have had a statute that states that a reasonable amount of the services rendered shall be free. And until some poor people brought lawsuits, this piece of the law was never enforced. So there sat the Preston County Hospital and a hundred others in your state, a hundred others in your state, all getting federal money. <coughs> and whoever enforced that requirement that a reasonable amount of the services be free. Then Secretary Richardson, with these lawsuits being won, announced that 20, I think the, the first announcement he made was that up to 25% of their net income had to be devoted to free care, or 10% of their total operation. Then there was such a blast from the American Hospital Association that he issued a new regulation. And if I'm not mistaken, I dropped the 25 to 10 percent and the total to 3 percent or something. And it's probably all headed down to zero unless we get on our hind legs to do something about it. But the law has been there, and it, you know, and it, uh, there's a chance of doing something about it. And I think Ms. White did us all a service by referring back to the state of Burton issue, which is now wide open. There ought to be a, a hospital like ours across the street, Paramount General, prides itself on a 
and a half percent collection ratio. And this is exactly what we're talking about. I mean, non-profit and very proud that it doesn't lose any money, you know, and it doesn't give any free services. And they, they'll go absolutely insane because they got a red, white, and blue construction sign out in front for that $10 million they got, you know, when it's discovered that they have to render up about 10% of that care and, and somehow, uh, you know, but they took the federal money and they also have to follow the federal guidelines. I endorse also a national health system. I, I, I think that there is no other way out. I prefer to call it that, national health insurance. Then in my last point, uh, it would be the, uh, I, it's a little disagreement. I don't agree that we shouldn't discuss and educate people about doctors or about hospitals because when they're ill and alone, they're going to have fear. It, that's not a reason not to educate. No, we're also educating them, as we tried to do last night, and you all contributed in the discussion, to the fact that they are isolated and alone, that they're not in some way dealing with it. But that's no reason not to educate. It's no reason uh, when a worker who is, uh, hasn't joined the union joins the union, for the union not to point out and educate the evils of the whole system, the exploitation of the system, just because in the morning he's going to go to work under a form. He hasn't gotten rid of his form. He hasn't gotten rid of the manager. That's no reason not to explain the whole uh, picture to him. He isn't going to have a revolution. He isn't going to have uh, all things solved. But we're trying to explain things like this. And more and more poor people need to understand the kinds of issues discussed, occurred, position income, even though one by one, all of us are going to be somewhat helpless when we're undressed. The bargaining power isn't equal when you're naked, when you're being examined, when you're being probed, when you're being stuck at. And uh, at that point, you're not fighting the system very effectively. And it has nothing to do with what you do when you get to a meeting like this or a hundred others. You can do something about the system, and we need to do it. And the rest of the comments uh, were excellent, and uh, I agree with them. That unite fine people, regardless of color, ethnic groups, and the rest of these kinds of things. Anybody have anything they'd like to add? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I noticed what you said about uh, bargaining time. You, you must be talking to those uh, <laughs> open gowns that they give you in the hospital. You dare not jump up in them. <laughs> but uh, what actually what I have in mind is uh, the fact that Welfare patients go in, uh, a woman goes in for childbirth. They allow her to deliver approximately 24 hours. They get her up just like any other herd of cattle and tell her to get out. And um, I said uh, to my, I felt that this was dehumanizing in as much as they were on welfare, they treat them less than human. I was um, up in a, a room with the girl. Well, they put her in a semi-private room because they just didn't have any room in the ward. Okay. Uh, she laid there. I admired her very much for her stand. She said, if they think they're getting rid of me today, they're not damn fools. So um, this was not her first or her last child. However, she said, I'm in no uh, condition to go out of here. So she did wait until the next day, but they did keep coming in asking her if she was ready to go, and she said no. Mrs. So, McLean, I, I mean, is this common practice not even well, you said I, mean, yeah, and yeah. I mean, does every welfare woman in any of the hospitals are 24 hours? Is that all they're allowed to spend? This is uh, well, then how come that, that, how come that, that hasn't been challenged long ago? How come the, it hasn't really been? You know, the ironical thing is that there is a theory that the quicker the woman does get up and get going, barring complications. Oh, 
Yeah. 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 I know there are already convictions, but I'm tired of having to stay in the hospital longer than the 24 hours. The average stays three days, right? I mean, uh -huh. Yes, because, you know, actually, I think it's the consensus that it takes this uh, length of time for them to actually treat her for, uh, so her wound can contract properly. Well, so, I didn't, uh, I didn't think the average person knows patients that are well well patients to start the contractions uh, to get the woman back in shape. They let her uh, deliver and then they wanted to get out, so they used the Can you come up with a place? case where the same doctor is taking care of two women and he sends the woman on welfare out in 24 hours and the woman that uh, is paying for his services stays the average of three days? I mean, I think well, these, from in the stories, too. you know, I think yeah. you should have documented stories, then get them to somebody and take them. Mm -hmm. to the, the proper place to do something about it. It doesn't do any good for us to sit in meetings like this and, and, and tell stories without coming up with the name of the people and when it happened and where and do something about it. Right? Well, you see, this isn't something I heard like I said I was in the room with her. Well, then I, but now this is Can another Can Mrs. White come up with the name of well, somebody? We can come up with, I know a lady named Mrs. Chaney, whose son had a third degree burn. She was on welfare or something to the Yeah, but now I'm talking about childbirth. Well, well, not a childbirth. This is welfare. This well, I have a way to get a child. Get a document, get a real story of the name of a patient, and do something about it. Not anything other than childbirth, because if this, then you can prove that this is real. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're making a real difference between their patients. Okay. Well, uh, here's another instance. Um, this uh, girl, now, she was white. Uh, she, well, she is white now. Um, but I uh, had a less than the question as much as she uh, delivered a black face, you see. So the, um, she wasn't married, uh, which uh, is a, was of no incident except to the personnel in the hospital. Now, when time came for her to have a transfusion, they let her know that she would get no blood there unless somebody would come in and get uh, and donate it. They said if you can't pay for it or someone doesn't donate it, you won't get it. So uh, at our uh, neighborhood center, we looked for someone to replace the blood so she could at least, uh, you know, get a transfusion. And as it happened, one of the neighborhood organizers went out and donated this blood. So uh, we didn't even know who the girl was. We didn't even, we didn't know her name. We didn't even see her until after the blood was donated. Well, what I'm saying and this is nothing to really good just to sit here and rock. I mean, everybody in this room agrees I mean, we're all sitting here agreeing with each other. But what good does that do if we don't do something about it? If we don't come up with a case and go to a place and say, this is what happened, do something about it. Let's okay. see if we could we have you know, kind of hold this. Because I think we're getting right in. What are the strategies that you do use? Um, it doesn't do any good for a group of people that are all in agreement to me. Well, and we have had cases like I want to say, where people have really been mistreated in childbirth, and we have went to them to get the statement. You have to have, before you go to the doctor, this person must sign this statement that this happens to her in order to take her with you to face them. All right, so you write the statement up because she has been mistreated as being a willful recipient. Getting her to sign is something else. Yeah. You know that 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 you can go way down there and know they're mistreated. It's a fear, this is what I'm saying. You can remove the fear from people. We have had many people being misused that have come into our office. We have wrote up the statements and willing to back them up and take them and go as far as the limit is. But if they don't sign the statement, we have no beef. I mean, because it didn't happen to us. They have to be one of the first ones that it happened. There's a place to begin. We have to we start, start on the Yeah, uh, look, we're willing to, to fight for us. There is a natural fear of welfare recipients to challenge the welfare establishment. <coughs> because um, when uh, people were 
uh, more or less about to starve. No food, no nothing that they could reach for in their home to uh, stave all hunger. All right, uh, we say, well, no, we can get you emergency sense, but you're going to have to go down here and talk to your worker. Well, she's this way, or she doesn't want, uh, you know, if I say too much, she might, you know, uh, suggest, you know, to the therapist that I go off of welfare. I might lose my ground. They may do this to me. They may do that. And even to get a person to apply for emergency food stamps after they have already received their check, which was all, which is always insufficient, then uh, we more or less had to tell them, well, the rate you're going, they're going to take you off anyhow because they know you're scared you're expecting it. And we had to actually coerce these people to go in. Now, a couple of us would go. This is uh, when welfare rights was more or less um, a better working organization. It was very well known. But I mean, there were more participants in the Cabell County area. And uh, we were more or less trying to get some activists in there who would take the places of the neighborhood organizers because after we went out in there, so many times they knew us as agitators, not as a person who was really talking from experience. So, but anyway, in several cases, we did get emergency food orders for the people. And uh, for a while, this worked very well. We had sent at least two with the recipient. And it was surprising when you said, well, we'll call for a fair hearing, how quick that they could get together a food order. So, um, but you have to force the people to go in and fight themselves. Well, well, let's start yeah, here. Why not uh, keep this moving? Why not drop back again? Why not use it in the house as it was used with welfare? Uh, now you well, 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 you're right because it deals with basically the same group. Right. So they are not all working together. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think that you know, really, we're starting to getting into to some of the problems that, that people are really concerned about with their area of really trying to tackle various uh, establishments. Some of them have been successful, some of them haven't. We thought this morning, maybe if we give you just two brief examples of agencies or community groups that they have had success, the way they approached it might help. Oh, uh, I don't believe we should start with coercion, really. I believe we should start with education because for a whole generation, these people have had the fear of God, but I'll take your welfare check away from you. And now, this is what they have said yeah. for the whole generation. I so need education first. Let's start from that base. Uh, Joan Ross, who's cap director from, from Huntington, went into kind of an agency that was in complete turmoil. As far as the community was concerned, it had the the old image of a cap agency. But now they really got something wrong. How did it happen? First, let me say it's not a total success for the number of things we've got to show it, because we don't. We have gotten some results on one small problem of the delivery of health services. Southwestern was originally a one-county community action agency in Cabell County. <coughs> Huntington, which is in Cabell County, is the largest city in West Virginia and probably has more available health personnel than any other area in the state, including Morgantown. And I think the statistics bear out that there's more doctors per person than any other area. And it merged and acquired the first two and then a third county. 
So it's now a four county community action agency. In 1967, <coughs> the original Cabell County and then the next two counties got a grant to do a research project on the problems of the elderly poor in rural Appalachia. And the purpose of this research project was to establish statistics and to document information to force the Social Security raises that later came. And there were 12 of these across the nation. And this was the Appalachian one. And its main thrust was just to get the statistical information to show that people who were on Social Security were not living in utopia and were not getting wealthy. And this was necessary so that Congress would legislate the, the kinds of changes that have been needed and are now forthcoming. In the process, we interviewed some 6,000 elderly people because we did not have census tract data for two of the three counties. We did a random sampling survey. And this meant that we dealt with all of the elderly, all the people over 55, whether they were poor or whether they were affluent. And in the process, we turned up, of course, it was a 22-page survey on every person interviewed, and we interviewed over 6,000. And we employed elderly poor people to do this. And they were trained, and they did an excellent job. And another part of the project was to demonstrate the employability of the older person. They interviewed all these people, and we came up with a lot of information on the availability of health care and health services, as well as their attitudes about health care and health services. Another thing came into the picture at the same time we were doing the survey, and that was that one of the staff people, who was from a rural Appalachian community, and I use the term very generously, it was a wide spot on the road with a, you know, sort of a bad reputation, brought a member of her family into a Huntington Hospital, which is a very beautiful facility and has a very, quote, good reputation. And this family member did not get into the emergency room. They were met by a nurse, and the nurse said, oh, you know, you're really all right. And you go back to where you came from. Well, the person died going back. So when we got into this, we discovered that basically this particular hospital, which was financed by city county funds, <coughs> felt that they had only a responsibility, this particular one got Hilbert, gets Hilbert tonight, they had only a responsibility to the taxpayers of the city and the county that was supporting them. And that this person was a rural Appalachian who was poor, and so they felt like they didn't really have a responsibility. So our problem became even greater because we have an educational problem. And that is the one of making Huntington aware that it is the resource center for this rural Appalachian area, and then making them open up their resources or to centralize their resources to make them available to this rural Appalachian area. So the, you know, the road was pretty clear cut for the CAP agency as to you know, what some of the problems were we were going to have to deal with. In the middle of all this, as Ed said, the CAP agency itself started to blow up because we were mixing counties that never before had communicated at any level. Affluent, poor, didn't make any difference. They never crossed the mountain from one to the other. We were mixing blacks and whites that had never seen one another before. The rural Appalachian poor white looked upon Huntington as Sodom or Gomorrah. And you know, when they came in, they were coming into the ultimate of sin. Many of the blacks had never been to rural Appalachia, and the fact that whites lived as they did was something they weren't used to. So all of this exploded at the same time we were discovering these tremendous health problems. And Probably some of the problems we encountered in dealing with them had to do with, you know, people not being able to separate which image we were coming out of. But we began to start knocking on doors and try to get technical assistance. And my introduction to Ed was one of, you know, at a meeting where I was literally ranting with frustration because I started going to the, you know, regular funding sources to bring in health services of various kinds. And we wrote program after program. We wrote a comprehensive program, health program for OEO. And we went down to Washington and 
you know, we had the statistics and the documentation you wouldn't believe. You know, we have a county that has three doctors, two of whom are over 65, more like 80. And, you know, we had one nurse in this whole county. There are 17,000 people without health care and all these kinds of 62 miles to the nearest health facility. We had all this kind of documentation. And OEO said, this is why I listened with interest to the story on WVU, because they said, well, now you've got a good university up there. And we'll be glad to help you with funds, but we'll, you get your personnel from that university. Stimulate them to get the caps together, stimulate them to put in a rural medical program of some kind. And then we'll be glad to help fund. And what they were telling us is, you know, you all get together and put the pressure on, we'll give you the money. If you can some way get them, and we'll even bait them with money if they'll do this. Well, West Virginia wasn't interested, and we tried a number of ways to reach the university, political and non-political pressure groups, and it just, they weren't ready for change. Uh, we, they also, I went to a, a ARC and they said, well, we can't fund you, we just funded Beckley. Look at all the money we're pouring into West Virginia. And I said, yes, but they're not available to these counties. Well, but we're poor, you know, we can only give so much to West Virginia, we have to give something to tie in. Kentucky was getting off all the other Appalachian states. You can't, you know, you're not eligible. <laughs> and so, yeah, you can't, you can't get money right now. We don't have health money for you. We met, we had the Senate, Senator Randolph set up a special meeting for us. We had, as I say, horrible statistics. And, you know, lots of people's groups, and we were not confined to the poor, because if you live in Upper Mud, or you live in Dolbone, you live in Lower Slobovia. <laughs> and it doesn't make any difference for you whether you're poor or whether you're affluent. There isn't anybody to take care of you. So, you know, we had all kinds of groups working together. And they still wouldn't listen, and we knocked on door after door after door after door. Finally, we began to go the foundation route. And in the meantime, we were, we were operating also a program called the Parent-Child Center Program, which deals with the child from birth through three and his total family. And it deals with all the factors that will influence the development of that child. And it's aimed at breaking the cycle of poverty. And again, we have the Rural Appalachian Project, and there is one in Kentucky that's a Rural Appalachian Project. And it became very apparent that one of the primary problems in our project was the lack of available health resources. And all the factors that influenced this, you know, the delivery of existing resources, the non-existence of a lot of resources, and so forth. And we got what was called an advocacy grant. And the advocacy grant was to advocate the rights of these people. And we through, again, surveying and through working in this program, had to come up with their primary need. Well, it was very apparent, their primary need. Before you can work, you've got to be healthy enough to go to work. You know, before you can have children who are healthy, you've got to be healthy, or your children, your babies aren't gonna be healthy. So there were all kinds of things. It was very apparent. You know, transportation is a problem to these health care needs. But the health care needs could prevent you from taking, you know, avail, um, taking opportunities with what you had in transportation. So they allowed us to begin talking about motivating somebody else with money. And we, we knew that we were going to have, we didn't know how much, but we were going to have some seed money that we had a great deal of freedom with, not a whole lot. And we used the money to begin motivating these foundations. And we had a very energetic staff person who made this her full-time job. And we were able to say, you know, okay, this is your job. We don't care how you do it, do something. You know, and so this, our staff, or this particular segment of our staff, became available to write grants for anybody else to do whatever needed to be done to meet the health care needs for these two areas. And this was backed up with the money from this advocacy grant. 
So they literally became a catalyst. This staff, segment of our staff became a catalyst, not to get Southwestern funded, but to become the catalytic agency to get other people funded and to motivate other people to work together by providing the staff time to write the grants, by providing all the legwork that needed to be done. And of course, you all know if you work in this area, there's, the legwork is fantastic. And you know, doing pulling all the pieces of the puzzle together, we ran into two foundations that were willing with our assistance, and they really didn't have the staff to do it themselves. But if we wrote the grants, and again, the regional medical program assistance has been invaluable. And we, you know, jointly with the regional medical program people and with Southwestern, and we all wrote the grants. We convinced the foundations, again, they didn't need a lot because the statistics are overwhelming in both areas, Crum and Little Harch Creek, West Virginia. <coughs> and so we wrote the grants. It's, a, it's taken not just the foundations coming in because they don't have that much money either. These are small foundations. They're not poor. We're talking about Ethel McDowell out of Turkey Creek, Kentucky. But they have money to build clinics, and they do build clinics. We're talking about Hygieia which in West Virginia is the only place that builds clinics. But it does build clinics. And they came into these two areas. Each one is a separate entity, and they're going to run their own clinics. Staffing. Where are we going to get staffing? OK, we went to the National Health Service Board. We wrote the grant. We started in the fight. And then we discovered you know, our image as a cap agency was probably going to cause us to <coughs> Because you had, we wrote or requested a doctor, a dentist, a nurse, a pharmacist, and a hygienist for each area. This meant that we had to get state certification of need and county certification of need. And again, we ran into the problem where with the county certification of need, Capital County, Huntington, had to certify the need for these other two areas. And none of the doctors and none of the dentists very few of the nurses, none of the hygienists, and the pharmacists had ever been into these two counties. They didn't even know about them, much less realize the problems. All they knew was that Southwestern's been on television a lot, and they're you know advocating. We weren't, but they were say, they were saying we were advocating federalized medicine, and they were really against us. And we had some real go rounds, and only somebody who's been through the you know what that. You know what that's like. I, the faces that I know here are because we've been in the state meetings, you know, fighting this battle. Uh, we got instant certification from the State Medical Society. Our route was effective. We went through a distinguished member who was aware, and he got it for us. So we thought, well, that's the route to go. So we went for the state dental. We found out that was not the route to go with the state dental society. <laughs> <laughs> and we started to plug it. It took us six months and, you know, 18,000 meetings and all kinds of experiences to do this. It was not a thing that was easily come by. What we finally ended up doing, and it's a strategy. I mean, you know, I'm laying it out as a strategy. We did have ourselves together. We knew what we were doing. We knew we were right. And as Joan said, we had the documentation behind us on everything. We called in the three television stations in Huntington and the newspaper, and we said, here's our problem. Here's the need. Little Hearts Creek and Crum, West Virginia have no doctors, no dentists, no nurses, high, no hygienists, no drug stores. There's nothing in these two areas. And they had to agree. And we, they've been working with us on sort of publicizing the needs of rural Appalachia. Huntington's relationship, and we never have stopped this. We, with the extension service, we conducted Appalachian <coughs> Heritage Weekends and all kinds of things to sensitize Huntington to its responsibilities, and we've never quit this. This has been going on. So they, we had credibility in that area, and they agreed. One reporter didn't believe us, and he went and checked our facts, and he came back and said, okay, you're right. And I said, now, this is our problem. The professional societies in Huntington have the power to deny these people out here services. We don't want to antagonize them 
any more than we already have. Because if we do, they can get so mad at us that they will forget the issue, which is health care for the people out here, and vote against it just because of us. So what we did is where they, I don't know if any of you saw them, but all three channels ran documentaries on rural Appalachia. Didn't mention Southwestern, didn't mention health care. They just started running, but every one of those documentaries, there were seven run. There were three half hour, no, five half hour, one hour, and one two hour. And all of them talked about rural Appalachia. And all of them obliquely, obliquely or directly or indirectly, got to the problems of the health and medical services. And finally, one dentist came to me and he said, I want you to call him off. He said, my wife's ready to divorce me if we don't sign the certification. And I said, sign the certification and we'll quit for the time being. So they did. It became a real issue. We got enough dentists to we got to the floor of the dental society. And you, you know, it took the combined efforts of people all over the state to get the Cabell County Dental Society to sign it. And once the Cabell County Dental Society indicated they would sign, then the state said they would sign. They would do, they left it up to the, to the local society. And the irony of the thing is, you know, there aren't any dentists from these counties. The only dentist from Lincoln County was the one we were paying to provide dental services to the people in, in Lincoln County for the last three years. And he turned out to be a rat bait. <coughs> You know, now, it may have been the pressure, and I suspect he was subjected to a great deal of pressure. But he is leaving us. In fact, has left now. And so we used every method. Now, we have success. The clinics will be open this fall. They will be staffed by National Health Service Corps doctors. Uh, grants have been written to ARC. They've been written to Regional Medical Program, which have been funded. They've been written to all kinds of various groups to get the amount of money necessary for equipment, supplies, staffing, everything that has to be done. And hopefully they're going to be open. They're multi-purpose, modular clinics, multiple, multiple disciplines. They have, or we are establishing linkages with the, I think the Mann Hospital, that's the last I've heard, and the ARC Hospital in Williamson. And yeah, ARH. And two years from now, the clinics will be independent nonprofit operations, separate from any federal involvement. And they will they will be a part of the community. Now, you know, they're already as far as consumer education goes, they're already pretty far down the line in the sense that any time a clinic starts operating, because the people themselves have done a lot of fighting. And these are people-oriented clinics already. And, you know, the community action groups, and I've heard a lot of antagonism about community action, but the community action groups in both of these communities, and the poor people that really brought them in. And, you know, there's no question about who's bringing these, these clinics in. The people brought them in. It wasn't community action. It wasn't parent-child center program. But the people have done all the groundwork, and the people are the ones that went out and negotiated the land to get the best deal. You know, and in one case, the deal is very good. Norfolk and Western has given it to them for a you know very small amount. But the people themselves have done all this. They came up with the land. They went out. And I'm talking about the poor people. So this is their. These are their clinics. So, you know, they're part way there because they are already saying, you know, we want things this way. And of course, we're ensuring that the boards will have a third poor people on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure thing. Right. Okay, I know no, the no, 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 I don't want to yeah. 
be an embarrassing thing yeah. because no. you're at a certain level and I know. Yeah. Uh, some of this has been discussed. Mm. Yeah, and some of it is not being resolved our satisfaction. <coughs> I mean, we're having to make compromises and other people are having. We're discussing it from the point of peer review on down. Both the, medical, both the medical and the dental society want the right of peer review. The board of the community action agency is saying that they are setting up an evaluation committee. For well, what? All right. Part of that will be the medical and dental people who want to do the peer review. But with them will be recipients. So the entire review will be the evaluation done, and it will include poor people, and it will recipients. And this is our way of involving them in the peer review and keeping the peer review from being the kinds of things that Mike Ross was talking about last night, you know, them evaluating themselves. Of course, it's a different situation because they're totally antagonistic anyway, you know. But it's still, there are people who are sympathetic. And you know we're working with those people trying to broaden their understanding because some of them will emerge as leaders and some of them will emerge as winners. Now, on in the terms of price.